This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon, good afternoon. The wind is blowing. Maybe we're going to get rain, but we're starting our day off with two black rhino. This is Safari Live. Good afternoon to all of you on this very gusty day. See David, I mentioned the wind again. <laughs> the wind is going to be hot topic this afternoon, but hopefully, well, the rhinos will distract us from the wind. My name is Taylor and on camera with me today is David. Lucky, get away with it. I need to think of some new nicknames. Anyways, you're watching a live and interactive safari and it's great to have you all here. So if this is your first time and you're wondering how you can chat with myself, Brent and Tristan, you can hashtag Safari Live or you can chat to us also on the YouTube chat. But enough of me. Look how beautiful these rhino are. Now for the regular viewers who have been watching every single day, really dedicated fans, you'll know but once you have a closer look at these rhinos, that these are the same rhinos we saw the other day, which is quite exciting. And the reason why I know that is because I'm pretty sure this was the bull, and he had very tattered ears from notches and maybe even just from fighting. I think that was the bull there. We'll have to wait until we come out from behind the bushes. But they're very happy and out in the open again, which is really lucky to see because they don't normally spend too much time out in the open. They prefer the thicker vegetation where they can hide away. But today they're putting on a real show. Look at that. You know, in sightings like these, if I was with, re not, I was going to say real guests, because that's ridiculous. Guess it was sitting on my car with me. I don't even think I'd be able to say anything because it really is so stunning to see black rhino out in the open like this, also with grass up to their chin and a beautiful tree line and sky and escarpments in the back. It truly is a breathtaking view. A very, very special place. Not many places you get to see something like this either. A couple of cars driving around too. Lots of vehicles. That's on one of the, oh, well, that's, yeah, not the, quite the river road, but that was back there. We think that's where we're going to head to try and find some lions look at that that is just stunning now come away from that bush please so we can just get one really good picture I'm talking to the rhino of course there we go oh, listens wow isn't that amazing so there we go that's the view that i was telling you about hard to beat that really just taking it in as well to see something like this And very, very peaceful. Now, unfortunately, black rhino have got the stigma attached to them, where dynamite comes in small packages, and that does ring true. But they're actually quite placid most of the time. And if you just give them a bit of room, they're fine. And when I was down in the Eastern Cape, the black rhino became very much habituated to the cars, just as lions, and wouldn't mind you at all, and walk, would walk right past the vehicle, which was incredible. And I'll never forget, a friend of mine sent me a video from this reserve saying, basically, to his guests, he, this black rhino had walked around behind his car. And the rhino was so close that he had to say, yes, don't touch the rhino <laughs> to his guests because they'd come that close to the vehicle. And very unusual to see something like that. Oh, and that's nice. The sun has decided to break free of the clouds too. So now you can really see the golden grass. Yes, I think that is the male there. Yeah, he's got the teddy ears. Now, an interesting question from Paula. You're wondering if rhinos are typically solitary or if they enjoy the company of another. Well, white rhinos are more social than the black rhinos. So 
you'll find there's a male white rhinos mark and defend territories and we see their territories all over especially in the sabi sand they're very prominent and then the females typically have a, a home range whereas with the black rhinos it's slightly different both male and female will mark and defend territories however i've seen some amazing things where we have had large groups of black rhino together there's been many or well, many um records of you know rhinos coming to drink down at the same watering hole but with a watering hole you could understand because often something as, as significant as a, a place to drink and rhinos need to drink regularly uh, they they will overlap in the various territories but during courtship they'll come together and I've told you a couple of stories about how I've seen sort of um, different groupings of black rhinos you know adult males with groups of females and youngsters and all very relaxed whether they were maybe sub adults and not quite marking and defending territories that's definitely a possibility they weren't really close sightings they were watched through binoculars um, and they were not the calmest all the black rhino and the sabi sand but still very lucky you'd get glimpses of them every now and then but they're beautiful and I haven't really seen them coming close to the vehicles. They sort of stay out in the middle where they feel safe. Now, Janice in Canada, you're wondering about the differences between a black and white rhinoceros. Well, it's actually quite simple. Not when they're on their own, it can be quite difficult, especially if you've never seen either species. And maybe this is your first time seeing a black rhino. So black rhino are smaller in size but they've got very pointy lips, so it's difficult to see it now though because they sort of half their head is tucked below the, the grass. But if they do come out into shorter grass, you can see it quite easily. So they've got very pointy lips and the top lip being almost prehensile. They use it like fingers almost to pull leaves off of the trees. And with a white rhino, their head hangs much lower than that of a black rhino and they've got a big square lip. And that's where the whole confusion came in with the white rhino was that it was the Veit Montre the the wide-mouthed rhino but unfortunately communication barriers and they sort of just went and black and white like chess com two complete opposites but that's not the case so this is also known as the hook-lipped rhino and um, the track is slightly different too uh, the white rhino track is much larger as you can imagine because they weigh a lot more than the black rhino and black rhino track is slightly more compressed and that's why because we saw a black rhino I don't know if I told you this and I told you that I saw a black rhino in the northern Sabi sand I've completely forgotten but um but yes yeah, so we saw one Ali and I were very lucky on two different occasions we assume it was the same one and it's quite a rare sighting to see a black rhino up in the northern sands and he was beautiful not having any of it with the vehicles though quite shy so you just got quick glimpses of him i managed to snap one or two pictures which was quite nice and very kind of him and i, I was convinced that it was a sub-adult rhino white rhino that had been walking around because i just had never seen any black rhino footprints up and up there and then when we saw it i went you know what i should have got out and had a proper look and i didn't but we got to see it anyway which was pretty cool uh, very windy out here though so maybe that's why they've also moved out into the open we know how the wind affects the various animal senses so even for rhinos where their eyesight is not their strongest sense will come out here now Ali you're wondering if the rhinos are protected out here in the Mara yes they are most rhinos are protected all over the world these days so there is anti-poaching units that go out on patrol last night when we were near the Purungat Bridge we actually met the the warden Daniel on that side which is quite nice very important people to get to know and uh, he was actually heading out we saw him he was just coming back from a patrol I think he said he was going to have a uh, go and get changed or have some dinner and then we bumped into them again out they went and um, yeah following all the various animals so not just protecting rhinos specifically but the elephants the lions the cheetah the leopard everything out here even the buffalo the impala just making sure all is okay so you look at that so that's quite quite nice interaction to see with black rhino you don't often get to see them being sort of intimate if you will or showing too much affection other than maybe a mother and calf so rhino horns are actually very important for a rhino and they're the only ones that should ever have uh, have to have the need for them because of course you know that's what rhinos are poached for for their horns 
And that's one of the reasons what they use their horns for, is they'll greet one another. Just as elephants will lock trunks or lions will rub heads, leopards will do the same thing, all the cats, you know, do that. That is how rhinos will greet one another. They are very, very affectionate, affectionate. This is so cool. This is really, really nice. Just standing out, not really worried about a thing. I'd be intrigued though to see how close they would wander to the cars. Obviously everyone's very respectful here of the rhinos and they know what a special sighting it is because there aren't many of them. So no one goes off-road chasing after rhino. Everybody sticks to the roads and gives them space. Now I wonder if they would be, f if they eventually will feel comfortable enough to come towards us. I mean, it's pretty amazing on a day like today, like I said, where the wind is gusting. And we're probably about 100 meters away from them. Yeah, I would say about 100 meters. So we're quite a distance out. And we're very lucky, of course. Things look deceiving because of our fantastic zooms on the cameras. Um, I'm being photographed again. <laughs> Smile, David. Should I pull a face? <laughs> Now here's a cool, here's, I've got a couple of stories to tell you about this and it's, it's to do with uh, Jacqueline's um, question which is what sounds do rhinos make? So they make a variety of different sounds from grunts and snorts to squeals and it's an embarrassing story but you know what, I feel like you all know so much about me already you probably wouldn't expect it. So I was very young guy, you know how excited I get about the most ridiculous things. You've just been sitting beautiful sighting, male and female rhino with a young calf, all interacting. Uh, I suspect that the female may have be coming into estrus again and the, the male was quite frisky and he wasn't interested in the car but he was interested in her so anyways this little one was now obviously moaning that it wasn't getting enough tension maybe it wanted to suckle i don't really know what it wanted so it started making these very high-pitched squealing noises trying to describe it like a dolphin but it doesn't really sound like a dolphin either and i'm not going to try and do it no david david's begging please nope <laughs> I'm done with embarrassing myself. So anyways, so basically watching us say, explaining that what this calf was doing is how uh, this little one was communicating with mom and it was really nice. Anyway, we moved on and we started watching some elephants uh, that came down to the dam to drink. And the next minute, sort of sitting there and doing this, because <laughs> I can hear this buzzing noise. And I swear, I just said to him, I actually leant down and I got mosquito repellent out and I said, I can hear the mosquitoes. I think, you know, you don't you want to get bitten. And my guest looks at me as if I was a complete idiot and went, it's the rhino making the noise. I genuinely had a moment of relapse and completely forgot that we were even with riders and had thought that that high pitched squealing noise that was now coming from behind me. And I don't know why, it just to me it sounded exactly like mosquitoes. So there I was, very embarrassing. I was also only 19 though. But I feel like that actually doesn't mean anything because I'd probably do something like that today. Oh, wow. Well, there we go. If you were not convinced that these rhinos were relaxed, that should put your mind at ease now. The fact that he has decided to lay down and have a little siesta in the company of all these cars. Oh, and her. That is fantastic. That is honestly amazing. So she must be coming into estrus, and that's obviously why he's hanging around. So it'll be exciting to see what happens. And I'll, what I'll try and do, though, for the next couple of drives is just popping past here and uh, see if we can't maybe find them and just spend a little bit of time with them every single game drive. Today we're lucky. We don't know of any lion sightings, so we need to go and look for them. So that's why we've... Uh, had an opportunity to spend a bit more time with these rhinos and they really are fantastic animals lovely wow okay seeing as though this lot is going to have a little sleep now i think that we might move on and, and go and search for all sorts of wonderful things we'll give him a bit of a break however brent is out and about and he had his heart set on finding the big cats and i'm sure he'll be hot on their heels Well, I've got a plan, and it's a plan of some note. We're going to look for leopard this afternoon, change it up a little bit. Uh, my name is Brent Earsmith, and I have a Craig, a.k.a. the Batman, not Batman, the Batman on camera. And we're heading now down towards the Mara River, uh, quite close to the Kichwe Crossing. And uh, have a quick look at the crossing. Uh, not many zebra and stuff around here, so I don't think the, the crossing is going to be too active. 
but there is a lovely little road that runs through the forest up here and we're going to work our way along the edge of the forest and hopefully we can find a magnificent Mara leopard. Remember, hashtag Safari Live if you have any questions for us. It is an absolute, it looks like an absolutely beautiful uh, afternoon uh, and, and it is visually stunning but there is a howling gale um, which could make finding certain animals a little bit tricky and a lot of animals really don't like strong winds but we will do our best to show you the magnificence that the Mara has to offer keep nearly losing my hat okay now in this part of the Mara, this top section, uh, there is there are a few different leopards that work through these little thickets and river riverine areas, and I'm hoping that we might get lucky enough to find one. I've been I haven't been to this area in probably two months. That's how long it is since I came down to this area. I've been opposite this area on the other side of the river. Um, who knows? Maybe we'll get a long distance visual of the six marauding Bilashaka boys. They, they do come into this area, but on the other side of the river. And who knows, maybe they might cross and start putting some pressure on the male lions on this side of the river. Okay. So we are at the Kichwa crossing. And uh, not much around here at the moment, but as I said, the main reason coming here is to actually work through uh, the riverine forest. There's also a lovely set of rapids, and with the Mara River being very high, there's been quite a lot of rain upstream. Uh, that that, that ra rapid might be quite spectacular. Let's go around the muddy part. Now, there are some big crocs sometimes here, and it's been quite a cold day with the wind howling away, so maybe we'll find some of the behemoths sun tanning no behemoths I think most of the sandbanks that the, the big crocs like to lie on have uh, actually disappeared you can actually hear the roar of the Mara River and we're gonna go have a look at that rapid shortly now, while we're looking for leopards through this forested area, it is also an excellent spot um, to do a little bit of birding, and there's some fantastic birds in the River Iron Forest. Uh, Paula is wondering what color shuka do I have today? I've got the red one from this morning and then I've got a, a blue and red one for my legs in case it gets a bit chilly later on this evening. I'm always packing about three, especially when we're on the long nights. Um, I use two as blankets, one as a pillow um, and, uh, and then a blanket on top of that. Okay, so we have a look here. This is sort of ideal leopard country. It doesn't matter where you are. We've got lovely bigger trees interspersed with little thickets. And of course the Impala and Thompson's gazelles often come graze quite close to the edge here. So an ideal ambush spot. Liz um, is wondering, are there roads into the forest areas at certain times of the year to allow traverse? Uh, no, Liz, this is one of the only areas and there's one other area on the other side. Uh, you have to realize that the forest areas are protected uh, and very heavily protected um, as they are uh, very, very rare. This is, there used to be a lot more of them uh, 30, 40 years ago. So there is no access into the forested areas. There are a few campsites within the forested areas. Oh, hello. See what I mean? You never know what pops up next to you. Suddenly out of uh, the long grass. 
Hello, hyena. <laughs> I don't know who got more of a shock, me or him. Rudely awakened. Sorry. Sorry, Howard. Off you go. Oh, he was having a good snooze in the long grass till we came along. Uh, of course, this area, you've always got a chance at, um, there's a pride of lions. There's three of them in the pride, three females. Oh, there's more hyena just sleeping out there. Yes, there's quite a few hyena out here. So you can see two more, or one more at least, hyena in the distance there, just having a snooze. Uh, there's another one popping out of the long grass. That's a sub-adult. Sorry to have woken you, chaps. Didn't see you there. That's what happens when you lie in long grass. Okay, well, let's keep moving. Well, the hyenas move out to find somewhere else to have a snooze before they begin their nocturnal ramblings. Odie Farthing is wondering which coalition is Scar in. Uh, Odie, he is in the Musketeer Coalition. Now, not the Cheetahs, of course, uh, the, the, the Lion Musketeer Coalition. Oof, wind is howling through this gap. I'll hold my hat down. Okay, we're about to get to this view of uh, the big rapid. I wanted to have a look how it looked with um, lots of wa uh, water in it. New? Oh, I know what it is. It is a uh, someone is going to be having a drinks evening here. Oh dear, that's why I wanted to look at the the river. have my sunglasses on because well I would like to keep my eyesight for a little bit longer than by the time I'm 35 and have to have my cataracts removed so we wear them in between um, it's very glary out here today which is making it a little bit difficult to spot things and also I'm very sorry that the gremlins attacked Brent it's very rude of them how dare they Brent will show them though I don't think he's the kind of person that tolerates that kind of nonsense I'm that lovely though. So it doesn't look like rain clouds, eh, David? Wind, wind clouds though. I don't know where this wind has come from. I was just saying this morning, I was like, I moved away from the Eastern Cape for that exact reason. And well, here I find myself. Blonde hair, you know, blasting in the wind. It's terrible. I suppose the view and the animals make up for it. And the company's not too bad either, so. You know, win-win. <laughs> so nice having digs at, at David or anyone who's behind the camera. Because they just sit in their glare going... <laughs> you know, you can say things back, eh? <laughs> oh, goodness. And, um, and poor Tristan as well is having some car trouble. But that's okay, he'll be back at it. You know, he's part of the tech team now, Tristan. He's got really good at doing all sorts of those things. He'll be fine. So our plan is really just to drive and hopefully see a cat somewhere. We'll see cars. We will also be responding to car sightings today if we see them all bundled up. That's, that's actually how you start off when uh, learning the areas. Well, that's what I did. We just drive, drive, drive and go right. There's 37,000 cars over there. That's where we want to go. And we normally do bets on, well, I, I don't know, I do it. Do, 
Does any of the other presenters do it? Just me. I don't know why. Every time we see cars, I go, okay, right, what do you think we're going to see? So when we got to the rhino sighting, I bet lion, David bet cheetah, both wrong. He's rhino. Even better, I think, well, in my opinion. Oh, there's an elephant. We, before I hit the brakes, we check that there's no cars behind me because I've done that before. Made them with someone crash into me. <laughs> that was, yeah, would have been an awkward thing to explain. Oh, and I'm parked with all the long grass. Now, hopefully the elephant won't be too hidden away. But there we go. Some lovely Bell 90s trees for you as the elephant moves and feeds in the grass. Although I haven't actually noticed the elephants in, on this side, closest to the escarpment, eating grass. They've been eating these little sort of little shrubs and things that are popping up after all of this rain. And then the ones that are closer to the river where the grass is actually favoured and it's browsed down quite short by the zebra and the buffalo and the wildebeest. So the alligators have been eating that. It's grown to a length now that they're able to pull it out of the ground because really short grass is quite difficult for elephants to eat. So it just depends, I suppose, where they are, what they're feeding on. But I can't see. What are you pulling from the ground? Maybe it is eating grass. Well, it's a young boy. There's a couple of them all scattered around the area, which is, of course, not uncommon. Oh, my goodness. Loud, soft. Sorry, David. So we turn the volume up while we're driving so we can actually hear what's going on, and then we have to turn it down when we stop. We haven't quite got the this whole thing sorted. There's another bull. Also beautiful at the base of the escarpment. So if anybody sees any cats while they're staring at the screen, <laughs> let us know. <laughs> Can you see anything, David? No, I don't see any shades of white. Normally they stand out. It's like a yellowish white color uh, that you will see. Normally trees and tufts of grass that are growing quite close together and termite mounds also look like lions. Elephants, not so much though. They're fa fairly easy to spot out here. Much easier out here than it is in the Sabi sand, but that's of course because this is predominantly grassland, oh, especially in this middle area. But I haven't really seen zebra, haven't seen wildebeest, topi, they're all hiding away from this wind. Hmm. Now, I love YouTube. Wouldn't it be ironic if you're asking that question via Twitter? Ha 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 ha. That would be funny. Uh, you're wondering if there are any animals that exclusively hang around on the escarpment. Um, well, there's lots of animals that use the escarpment. The elephants go up there, the buffalo go up there, the giraffe go up there, uh, the zebra come up to camp every single night and spend their evening in camp and then go back down and graze again. Um, you might find that you'll have troops of you know, baboons specifically living on the cliff faces, probably a couple of leopards that might be a bit shy and don't want to come out into open. That's also fine for them to live up there. Um, bird species that will nest up on those cliffs, you know, maybe spend their time around there. Whether there's a specific species that if the Ololola escarpment were to vanish, um, whether there'd be one species that would go extinct because that's the only type of vegetation you can live in, I'm actually not sure. I haven't been in the area long enough and sadly I haven't done any walking and exploring just yet but that's something i'd like to do when i have some time off is maybe go f try and organize some walks somewhere i don't know where but we'll find somewhere and horseback safari we need to do one of those uh, that would be very exciting It'll be my first horseback safari in the wilderness in the real wilderness see they aren't eating grass they're eating these little shrubs now i need to try and figure out what these little shrubs are that they're feeding on because i've as i was saying i've been watching it for, since I've been here, really, when they feed up against the escarpment, they're not going for the grass. Also, very tattered ears. The animals have a lot of character here. I don't know if you've noticed that. They seem to be a lot more scarred up, I suppose. Or, or you know, tattered ears. Life's tough from them out here. There's so many more of the same species of animals, so the competition is definitely a lot uh, more aggressive than what it is in the Sabi sand. But that is so gorgeous. <laughs> now, LK, is it not MLK? Is wondering, sorry, look at my hunch. This is my, I'm just quickly let you in here. This is my watching the monitor and presenting <laughs> position. I was caught red handed, so I thought I'd better explain myself. Hold my heavy head up and then stare at the monitor because, uh, yes, that's what we have to do. Um, where, how is Maurice doing? Maurice, come out of your cupboard. Shame. 
here, but Maurice is living in here with Snoop Dogg. <laughs> See, they basically become best friends now. Snoop Dogg and Maurice the elephant. <sighs> it's pretty ridiculous now. We better stop though. We're gonna we're gonna get into trouble. I have to behave now. Sometimes I have to act like a professional. Not always. Most of the time. So Maurice is doing fine. Maurice is just taking a break at the moment. Hey, you know, <laughs> jumped. Oh, hang on. Everyone, hold on. There's an ostrich. I have not put an ostrich on screen yet, and I've been chasing them for I don't know how long. So let's get this sorted. Um, so basically, yes, Maurice is, Maurice is just taking a break. The fame got to his head. So I had to put him in time out, you know, just bring his ego back down to size again. Sometimes he gets a bit of air in himself. Oh, wow. This is going to be exciting. It's a beautiful male ostrich. He's quite excited, probably from a variety of different things, and the fact that he's got his breeding feathers on, or he's actually might run towards us. No car, stop! Well, welcome back. Unfortunately, it seems that there's some gremlins living in the forest down by the river, so we've just moved out a little bit. And it seems like Paul Taylor's also found some. So we're heading now away from Kitchwe. We're going to keep in this area. We're going to head towards the Samaki Swamp. And uh, what we're going to do there is, again, keep along the edge of the Mara River and keep checking in all these beautiful big ebony trees and Walbergia trees and see if we can find a spotted tree climbing cat. We've been having so much luck with the spotted ground cat, so we might as well have a go at a spotted tree cat. Hi Paula! Uh, Paul is wondering, do we have any animals that regularly come into our camp? Indeed we do. Zebra is probably the most frequent. Uh, bush baby, Janet, uh, leopard a couple of times, and uh, probably more disturbing, the hippo that comes up from the dam that supplies our water. Uh, hippo and occasionally elephant. Um, mongoose as well. So a few different species that regularly come into camp. And uh, Elan sometimes, but less so. We've had wildebeest once or twice. Uh, we haven't had any of these guys in camp yet. Oh, a bushbuck. I saw a bushbuck when I was going to fetch the car yesterday morning at about 5.30. Hello, big defasa. Oh, he's a nervous defasa. Now, that'll be due to the wind. Everything's a bit jumpy uh, in the strong winds. Hello, defasa waterbuck. And parlor in the background. So there are very, very pretty antelope. Very elegant antelope. How are you doing? Uh, very, very ele elegant antelope. And uh, the females are particularly pretty. Now, the males here don't seem to have as impressive horns as uh, the southern waterback, which is the one you see at Juma. And, uh, of course, the big difference between them, they look very similar, apart from the fact that these guys do not have the circle on their bottom. They've just got a white bottom instead. Okay. I wonder what else is out here. And you can see the wildebeest have done a spectacular job mowing this lawn, and uh, the hippos are keeping it even shorter. So, of course... We're right next to the Mara River. This area is what some of the hippos' favorite grazing. And we do see a lot of hippos out at night. I think the most I've seen in a group was around the Musiara Marsh. I think we counted, while we were sitting with sleeping lions, we counted over 60 hippos around us. There are some pigs. And behind the pigs is Little Governor's Camp. There we go, and 
There we go. You can see there's quite a few pigs. You can see some tents in the distance. So Little Governors is on. It's a, another little marsh. So it actually loops around a marsh. Hello, pig. Now, uh, if you look towards the camp, I saw some baboons running around on the edge of camp, um, right in the trees on the opposite side, Craig. I think they've disappeared. But um, Papa Dino was wondering about baboons and do we have the same problems? We don't, uh, Papa Dino, not yet. Uh, our camp is new and we're very, very particular about how we uh, store our rubbish. Now. What happens in the Sabi Sands is a lot of that baboon behavior has been learnt and taught over many generations. Now, Little Governors was kind enough to put Jamie, Senzo and myself up when we broke down near the Musiara Marsh um, for the night. It was uh, very welcome because we were met wet, it had been raining and um, Paka was having a, a problem with its fuel filter. So all I, I smelt of diesel, I think I bled that, bled that system about eight times that day. So eventually at about six o'clock, seven o'clock in the evening, I was done. And um, we got to ride on a boat across the Mara River from the other side to Little Governors for the night. And then go back on the boat the next morning uh, to go get Pucker, try get Pucker up and running again. Now I'm hoping as we head towards later in the afternoon, the uh, wind will stop. And if the wind stops, it is going to be a truly spectacular late afternoon here in the Mara. Now, I, I do I do love a, a bit of Hemingway, and uh, Hemingway spent quite a bit of time in, in Kenya. In particular, he spent actually quite a bit of time in the Mara and in the Northern Serengeti. And uh, he actually penned the green hills of Africa uh, while recovering from an aeroplane accident. And he was recovering um, on the coast of Kenya near Diani Beach. And um, one of the, his more famous quotes about Africa came out during that time. And that was that, there's never a day I wake up in Africa and I'm not happy. There we go, a little bit of Ernest Hemingway. Before you, we send you all the way back to South Africa and to Juma, uh, where Tristan has managed to scythe through his aerial gremlins and is ready to welcome you to a very dry Sabi Sands. Good afternoon and yes, welcome to our sunset safari from the Sabi Sands, a very dry Sabi Sands, as Brent Leo Smith says, still no rain as yet and as he alluded to my name is Tristan and on camera today I do have a senzo and remember that you can get hold of us on hashtag safari live on Twitter or on the YouTube chat because we are interactive now we have had some aerial issues Wendy decided all of a sudden that she didn't want to work today and her little aerial tail that almost looks like a little warthog's tail decided to break in half and just fall over so the welding broke and rusted through and so we had to rush back home and change onto Rusty and Rusty unfortunately had a few flat tires so I had to quickly sort those out and but now we're up and running and everything's good. It seems as though things have been quite busy. I, we were out for quite a while. We had already gone and done our time lapses on quarantine and treehouse and we were down at Twin Dams where there was Kudu's alarm calling and squirrels going crazy. So I think there's a leopard down that way. So I want to head back into that area and try and see what's going on. Hosanna apparently this morning was lost going into devilishly thick bush and going into that drainage line of Biffle's Hook Dam. So I'm not too confident of him or finding him this afternoon. So I think what we're going to do is head rather towards Twin Dams, try and see maybe little tumbers around and he's the one that is causing a bit of a stir that side of the world. And so we'll head 
there. If failing all of that, I'm then going to come back to the northern side and we're going to check Biffelzook boundary for two, three reasons actually. One, we'll go past Biffelzook Dam for Asana if we have no luck with Tumba. Two, we'll go to see if maybe the Inkohuma Pride has come back towards the boundary. And three, maybe our buffalo herd is at Sydney's Dam for an afternoon drink combined with the Inkohuma Pride. And given that Gauri Repeater is working, we should be able to get some signal from that area and hopefully we'll be able to bring that all to you. So that's the plan for the afternoon. Lots Lots of exciting things in the air and lots of exciting times hopefully and we should theoretically have some luck somewhere around and this morning we had a oh so everybody is shouting and requesting Senzo socks I'm afraid everyone's going to be disappointed because he does not have any socks at all he's busy looking the opposite direction ignoring me because he I'm <laughs> <laughs> so Senzo is saying it's partly cloudy with which means no brightly colored socks. Senzo I don't know I think you're pushing it today it's quite sunny considering it's not too bad so hopefully we will see Senzo with some socks tomorrow but today it's sockless it's invisible sock day today apparently and so we've got no socks at all. But what we do have is some rather colorful headed guinea fowl. So I haven't seen these guys for a while but they're sitting in the nice open clearing and just foraging around. I've seen them this morning actually in a similar area and they, you can see they're digging around looking for any seeds that they can find. It's a tough time of the year if you're a guinea fowl. Hard to find food and so they dig a lot. They root through elephant dung and various other dungs of the herbivorous animals and try and find some signs of food in there. So tough times for the guinea fowls and it will change fairly shortly. Once we get the rains these guys will be very happy and thriving. Although they don't look as though they're very skinny do they? They all look quite plump actually. But they are a beautiful bird. They, uh, maybe beautiful is a strong word. Their feathers are beautiful and their head is quite eccentric but not pretty. It's almost very prehistoric in that they've got these kind of helmets on top and these wattles. So they almost look a bit dinosaur-like with that helmet structure. And so I suppose beauty is not quite the right word for them. The feathers themselves are pretty. What is beautiful is a parrot. And there is a parrot calling right next to me. So Senza, I don't know if you can see it. Just on the left here. Rita, you say the helmeted guinea fowls are a new bird for you. That's interesting. This is quite common here. I would have thought we would have got them or if Byron would have got them on his bird challenge. Well, but I'm glad that we have added a new bird to your list. It's always exciting when you get new birds. There's a brown-headed parrot and that's a very, very good view of a brown-headed parrot. In fact, I haven't seen a brown-headed parrot this nicely in quite some time. And you can see it's busy feeding off the russet bush willow. So the russet bush willow has got some pods and is busy kind of being fed upon so it's breaking off those winged areas opening the nut and then getting the seed out of it so using that really powerful parrot-like beak with that sharp point that's able to dig in and, and break open that pod and get to those seeds inside that taste very good now that russet bush willow is an interesting bush because it's a, or tree should I say it's not really a bush they do get quite big in that you can use those pods us as humans can use them for tea so if we put them in water and we boil it up it then makes a nice tea that you can drink I'm not a huge fan of it to be honest I, I don't find it that nice but a lot of people find it okay and, and it's used quite a lot locally for that. It's amazing how well these parrots are able to feed off the seed. If I went and grabbed that seed and I showed you just how difficult it is to actually get to the nut inside, you'd be surprised. But this little brown-headed parrot is making it look easy, easy, easy. Like I said, it's probably the best view I've had of a brown-headed parrot in a long time. Paula, you're asking if these parrots are able to learn how to speak with humans around. Yes, this parrot here is the shyest of the group. Unfortunately, we don't have our talkative parrot here. He sits somewhere else and is often saying hello when you drive past and gives us directions to the nearest animal. No, I'm just joking, Paula. They don't learn us. Remember, they, they start out as an egg. They spend all their time as a parrot and the interactions with people is few and far between, to say the least. In fact, this is the closest I've been to a parrot in about a year, so they're not very very commonly seen so close and they really don't take after people in any way they're not raised by people and therefore they don't mimic people in any way whatsoever they try and kind of just speak parrot which is that squeaking sound that you hear now and so no they don't speak any human languages although I think if you had one as a chick you might 
Timmy, you say brown and parrot is new for you as well. I think some of you have been birding with us for quite some time and have also battled to get brown and parrots on the screen. We often hear them and we try to get them on the screen, but they're such fast flyers and they can be a little bit difficult to find so this is a really one of the best sightings I've had since I've been at Safari Live in terms of being on camera so we really are being spoiled by this one because he's low to the ground he's not too obscured you can see the nice green on the front and then that brown head so we really are quite spoiled with this particular sighting it's also quite relaxed generally the brown headed parrots as we come along fly away but this individual is so busy feasting off his russet bush willow pods that is not really concerned with us at all so really is quite a cool sighting and i'm glad that we've added another bird to your list seems as though we've been doing quite well this afternoon two birds and two new additions to two different lists which is great Romits, you're asking if people use this species of uh, parrot as pets Robert no so they 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 won't in the pure reason for that is that it's not really legal to be taking birds out of the wild particularly in these national park areas you'll be in a lot of trouble if you had to capture a brown headed parrot and then domesticate it I suppose they are in the illegal pet trade where there sometimes are parrots like this in captivity um, and I, I would imagine this parrot would be like no other parrot in that oh it would be like any other parrot should I say in that it would be able to be tamed and be able to be put into a cage and raised by people but out here you're not allowed to take these birds out of the park like any other animal they're all protected we're in a protected area and that's considered poaching to remove them or to raise them in any way now coming up and over us in the front is also two of our favorite birds and it is the Wahlberg's eagle and they're in a display flight look at this they're busy going after one another and I wonder if maybe the dark form one is here with the pale form or are these two pale forms but they went down at one at one another and kind of chased each other so I'm trying to get my binoculars just to see who's who but definitely the Wahlberg eagle pair the one came towards the nest and the other one then chased it so that's the dark form that we've got there and the pale form was the one that was also around which has now disappeared so I wonder if there's a bit of interaction going on now and they've worked out this dark form one is now worked out hang on a second somebody's intruding in my nest and is coming to start war so let's go forward because he's heading straight towards the nest itself and I think that pale formed one landed in that area there I see him he's dive bombing straight towards that section let's quickly try and get there Obviously it's difficult to keep up with birds of prey, they fly quite quickly and it's, you know, especially when there's a bit of a wind blowing, it's really quite hard to keep up with them. But they've gone past the nest now, it seems as though they've kind of dive bombed further away. Hmm. But it was definitely the dark form and a pale form one that was here. Now whether or not there it goes, it's just taken off again and is flying this. There they're following each other. Look, here they come on the left, dark form on top and pale form on the bottom. And it seems as though they're following one another around and just skirting the tops of the treetops. I wonder if they are just chasing one another or if this is more just the pair together. It's very uncommon that the pair would go after one another. hit each other in mid-air just now. And sometimes eagles will do that. They turn on their backs and they put their talons up. And the other one comes down and they kind of lock talons and then they tumble a little bit. So they did that just before we got the camera on. And then now they seem to have split a little bit. But that was exciting. That was good to see. And I wonder if, like I say, the dark form is not thoroughly unimpressed with the fact that there's another there's the light form is just or pale form has just landed at the nest now and i don't know if this is a different individual or because i the last i saw of the pale form was going off in that area but here is definitely another pale form Wahlbergs at this nest this nest is turning out to be a saga of note it seems as though there's definitely some sort of competition raging over this particular tree and this particular nest site and that there's a lot of things going on so there she is or he are oh, they beautiful when they're this lighter color you can hear some of the franklins are alarm calling because of these two, all these birds flying around but isn't that beautiful i wonder what's going on though it's very interesting behavior from them and, and to see because we know that there was two pale forms here then this dark form again today is back in this area which we haven't seen for the last two days so I have no idea what's happening I think it's possibly a territorial thing between two different pairs at the moment and they're having a go at one another and they busy dive bombing and chasing and I think they're trying to work out who's going to end up nesting 
in this particular section. And it's going to be interesting to see if they, if the dark form and pale form Wahlberg's pair gets pushed out, if they f go somewhere else and head towards the treehouse dam, I mean the twin dam's nest further south of us along the banks of the Mulawati. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Very cool though, either way. They are beautiful. See how feathered the legs are? So that's part of the true eagles, that when they have those feathered legs, unlike things like brown snake eagles, which have the bare legs, so they're not considered to be part of the true eagles, which is what these guys are. And they're a fine example. And remember, these are migratory, so for some of you who might not have seen them before, that's because they've only just started arriving back in the last week or so. And they are feverishly prepping nests to start laying eggs as soon as possible, so as they can... Oh, itchy beak so as that they can breed and get their young ones strong enough to start moving northwards again at the end of summer. Robert, yes, they could hunt guinea fowl, for sure. Um, it is possible, but generally the Wahlbergs goes after slightly smaller birds. So red-billed quellias is one of its biggest targets, and then small birds like that. So you'll fi find that they go after sparrows sometimes, they'll go after canaries, buntings, um, so the smaller passerines is what they go after, and then also termites. You'll find when we get termite um, hatches and the winged alits are out of the nest, I mean out of the termite mounds, these guys are generally there in full force picking them up and feeding off those alits as they come out. So that's what they target. Uh, uh, guinea fowl is probably a little on the large side for a Wahlberg's eagle. The guinea fowl are normally left for things like the martial eagles, which is a much, much bigger, much heavier bird than what you see with the Wahlbergs. Wonderful though, really, really good. Right, I'm going to leave our Wahlberg's eagle to itself and leave it to work out its differences with all the others that are busy flying around. I can't see any sign of the other two, so while we do that, we're going to head towards Mulawati, but I believe Brent Leo Smith still bumbling about in the Mara and hopefully he's going to have some luck. Well, in our search for the elusive prince of predators, the leopard, uh, we have found the king of the birds. Uh, a lovely little family group of ground hornbill, adult male, adult female, and two generations of chicks. And we can see the youngest one hasn't quite developed the bright red coloration yet. Looks like... Oh, there's lots to eat. I don't know what they're eating. I can't really see just yet. But they are finding plenty to scoff. It looks like there's quite a lot of grasshoppers hopping up in front of them. I think whatever they're eating is a bit smaller. They are fantastic birds. And I call them the king of the birds for good reason. And... It's an older vendor story, actually. I haven't told a folklore story in such a long time. Now, it goes that there was a war between the birds and the snakes. And of course, that comes from the fact that birds very much don't like snakes, and snakes very much like eating baby birds. So there was a war between the birds and the snakes. And uh, it was very evenly matched for many years. And the ground hornbill did not get involved in, in, in the fight. And the king of the snakes, the black mamba, was on a killing spree and killed lots and lots of birds. And the birds begged the ground hornbills to please, 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 the birds come get involved in the fight. And uh, the ground hornbills didn't and it carried on and then the bats joined the snakes let me just pull us back a little bit how's that Craigie and then the bats joined into the fight and they joined on the snake's side and the birds were losing horribly and they went again to beseech the grand hornbills for help and eventually the ground hornbills agreed and the black mamba raced at the front of the snakes leading the charge towards the ground hornbill and the ground hornbill stood its ground 
And as the black mamba arrived, it snapped it in two and chopped its head off. And the birds then decreed the ground hornbills to be the king of the birds. An old vendor folk tale. Now, it obviously comes from the fact that ground hornbills are prolific snake eaters. They, um, they eat a lot of snakes and uh, rodents, lizards. Um, and the other thing is that the birds maybe forgive them for being their king because they also eat baby ground nesting birds and other ground nesting birds eggs they are predators after all there we go so we're right against the mara river you can see the escarpment in the distance we got a lovely herd of zebra here as well quite a lot of zebra down here um, we are in search of leopard so we're right up against the forest but it's lovely to have the open grassland off to the west of us And see, we've got a pig or two as well. Uh, oh, zebra fight underneath the big tree. Uh, zebras can be very aggressive with each other, biting, kicking. Look at that. Trying to get the upper hand with those incredibly sharp teeth. See how they try duck and dive to avoid the teeth. Oh, gotcha. On the neck oh that's going to be sore and those when they rear like that it's to try disengage when they've been bitten and the one on the left at the moment is definitely getting the upper hand <laughs> you can see the other zebras have no interest in those two probably two young 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 stallions And these zebra fights can get very, 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 very serious. And often people see wounds on zebra and assume they're from lions, but often it is from zebras fighting with each other. Look at that. Both going to ground, trying to not expose any soft bits. Zebras will bite the understomach and, and other places of, of each other to try and flex some serious damage. Oh, look at that. It's quite the battle going on there. See, back to ground again to protect the soft stomach. Ah, I think, here we go, you can see the loser is deciding discretion is the better part of valor. I'm out of here. So he's got a bit of a limp already. Oh, is he going to take a chance to attack from behind? Oh, sneaky. Oh, there we go. And so it continues. I've seen zebra fights go on for three, four hours at a time. When well, I'm going to actually try to get a little bit closer. They are getting quite far, so hold on. And that gives me a chance to answer Bethany's question. Are there southern or northern ground hornbills? They are southern ground hornbills. The northern ground hornbills only occur further north in Kenya, up towards Samburu. Sorry, pigs. We're going to get a bit closer to that zebra battle. Now, we don't want to get too close to disturb them and stop them fighting. But although it looks like they already have, unless there's another sneak attack coming. It's all gone quiet. It's those two there um, that are standing with a, that smaller one in between. Those are the two that were battling. Are we calling it a draw, boys? I just want to wait a little bit to see if uh, there is an attempted sneak attack again. Now, there could be a female coming to Estrus that's started the that nonsense uh, they look a bit young actually so i think it might just be practice fighting ernest says they were fighting for the upper hoof yes indeed 
Well, it looks like it's all over now. So it's just to show you what's on the other side of us. We've got some lovely zebra here, but well, the reason we're checking this area for leopard, and as you look at this, you'll understand why I'm here. So we're right on the edge of the River Rhine Forest, and I'm hoping it's a spot, a spotted cat lounging in one of these beautiful big ebony trees. Oh, we can hear some mayor's parrots in there somewhere. And who knows, we might be lucky with a Taraco or two in this area. Oh, is the fight starting up again? Let's get a little bit closer. Nah, it's all over now. I think they called it a draw. Well, let's go to Taylor, who's also enjoying that bustling wind we're experiencing in the Mara at the moment. Oh, it's so wonderful. Thanks, Brain. Can you believe it that the ostrich are evading me so much? I can't believe that I was going to give you the most fantastic sighting and then the gremlins jumped on board. Very rude of them and also disappearing into the long grass, not having any of it, is a pair of warthogs. You might be able to just see there, just to the right, their heads just above the long grass. There we go. Cool. Oh, you got big tusks. And off they go, running away. They don't want to hang around here. Oh, there they go. Look at, don't you think it's funny the way that they run with their, well, their nose is almost pointed to the sky? They're desperately trying to see over that long grass too. Now, the only part that really sticks out is the tail. And then other than that, and they completely disappear. And you see there, it's got to try to lift its head up. That was funny. Um, <clears throat> it's obviously quite dangerous for them to run through this long grass because they don't know what's on the other side. So there could be lions laying flat doing what they do best or a leopard or even a cheetah just sitting there waiting for them and they'll run straight into the lions. Well, that's what the lions would be hoping for anyways. So, ostrich. That is just ridiculous. But David and I were discussing it and I was telling him about the whole saga, how I kept trying to find these ostrich in, in Duma and I couldn't. So I said that I shouldn't be too desperate because the ostrich out here in the morrow, they can sense this and then it repels them. So it's fine. We won't get upset about it. We'll just move on until another ostrich fighting appears right next to the car. That's the goal. But we did have quite a cool question earlier from Romit. And that was, what is the difference between uh, the Mara experience and the Kruger, meaning the Juma, the Sabi Sand experience, in terms of the animals that you see and their behavior? Well, Robert, the most important thing there is that animals behave differently in different areas. So out here, everything is wide and open. Yes, the grass is tall, so small animals like warthogs, they can't see above it. Uh, will panic slightly. So we see a lot of animals using termite mounds and fallen trees as various vantage points. Um, but you also see the, how relaxed the birds are. The vultures sitting down onto the ground, you know, resting rather than roosting up in trees in the sabi sand. It's very dense, very thick, so you don't often get to see that behavior. Normally, see when you see vultures on the ground in the sabi sand, you would suspect that there was maybe a kill on the ground. Or, uh, so you'd go racing in to have a little look. Um, and it's different here, yeah, completely different. So, the animals that you see here, I think, are more special. And the reason why I say this is because I've seen all the animals that I haven't seen in a very long time. For instance, seeing that striped polecat, which I'd never seen before. That was amazing. I've only ever read about them. Didn't think that we were going to come across that. Seeing so many white-tailed mongoose, seeing porcupines at, at most nights in the dif difference, you know, in the distance, not the difference, digging for roots. And then last night I saw an oddball, which was really cool. And we had quite a nice sighting of it. It was a fairly quick sighting, which they typically are, but it did turn around and give us one last post. So I'll see if I can find that video at some point and then I'll try and play it for you. It's not gonna be as good though, but it'll be nice to have a look. I'm sure some of you have never seen an oddball before. And then bat-eared foxes everywhere. So that's um, really quite nice to see. Whereas the Sabi sand, because the vegetation is so dense, it's really difficult to see these animals. And they're around because we see their evidence. We see their tracks, we see their dung, 
we see the anal pastings, we see all these different signs that they leave behind, but to catch a glimpse of one is a lot more tricky. So I suppose it's, it's you know, it's much of a muchness. Anyway, the reason why we've come down here is to actually look for the Egyptian goose pride. This is one of their favorite spots. But as you can see, nobody appears to be home right now. It's drying out, eh? This actually doesn't hold water very well considering the amount of rain that we have had. It's uh, slightly disappointing. I'm just sort of doing a slow roll because my foot is as flat as it can go on the brake, but we're still moving. <laughs> okay, right, let's carry on then. But they like it around here. Mm, if I were a lion though, I'd be keeping out of the wind. So I'd probably be lying flat in the grass actually. Let's just check because just speaking of shelter, there's obviously a ridge on uh, this dam or around this pan here. See if maybe they're not curled up around the corner. You never know. Might as well check. Imagine the whole pride of lions laying here. Oh, that's loud. Let's have a quick poke our nose around the corner very quickly. No, it does not look like anyone's here. Okay, well, we're going to keep searching for the Egyptian goose pride and hopefully them or the, an ostrich will sort of jump out and say hello. Tristan has decided to take the road less traveled. I have indeed and the reason why is because there was a brief visual of Tumba walking up here and I've got his tracks on this pathway and so I'm trying to follow them because there's no sign of him in the Mulawati but it looks like he's heading in this general direction which is a pathway that is often used by the leopards. I've seen Hosanna use it, Shongile, Tingana, Tandi, they all use it. It's just on the bank of the Mulawati and it's got a nice little kind of two track that runs through it from all the sightings we've had and the, where we we drive so he seems to be moving slowly along this now I want to try and see hopefully he's not moving too fast because otherwise it's gonna be a bit tough they the visual of him was just after we got back to the camp so it was a few minutes from when we first said hello to all of you so hopefully he is here somewhere I just want to check this pathway again if he came this way or if he carried on going northwards it seems as though he's gone northwards but it must be him. It's it's quite a big footprint, um, and they said it was a young male. So, unfortunately, the guys that saw him couldn't follow in this direction. So, it's now up to us to try and find him. And, and those kudus and squirrels that were going crazy were a good indication that there was something actually lurking around in this general vicinity. So, it was worth coming and checking and his tracks obviously are here so now it's just about finding him I'm sure he's just lying somewhere in this or he's being typical tumba and is investigating everything that is around now if there's no sign of him here then he might have already gone towards twin dams for water which we'll go and check just now so I'm gonna try and see maybe I can get in here where are you, Tumba? Seems like he likes to move around. Kimmy, you say don't break my earpiece off-roading. Well, I'll try not to. I hope that I don't break my earpiece off-roading. I just have to watch it. I've actually tucked it in before we came into this area. I know it's quite thick. So <laughs> I had quickly tucked it in just to make sure of it and to make 100% certain that we don't have an issue. Tumba, where have you gone? I don't see your tracks anywhere here now. There's some impalas there, so they look quite relaxed. I wonder if he hasn't gone towards Twin Dams and has just gone for a drink of water instead of being on this bank. Maybe he crossed back over the Mulawati and is headed for water instead because with all these impalas that are super relaxed here, I don't think there's much chance that he is actually in this general vicinity. Unless he's stalking them, of course, which we know then is going to be quite tough to find him, given how flat they go. We saw yesterday with Hosanna how he was down and how he was 
seriously, seriously low in the grass and it will be tough. It was hard to see him on the dam wall in the complete open. Now you're talking about an area where there's some grass is very difficult and it's going to be hard to find a leopard in a situation like that. So let's check here. No, no tracks here. I think he's gone towards twin dams. That's what my bet is. I think he's gone for water. If not, finding him is going to be a tricky, tricky, tricky business. But we know he's here. It's just a matter of just being patient and looking around and checking and making 100% sure we check every available option to us before we head out of the area. Here is a nice... So Megan is wondering if Hosanna counts as far as my cat streak this morning. Well, I would say yes. I mean, at the end of the day, we saw him. It's, uh, the fact that we didn't have signal is not really kind of our fault. We, we still found the leopard and we're still with the leopard. So I suppose we did see it. But if you want to be technical, we can say no. And, and we can try and find another leopard. And hopefully that will then satisfy Megan. We've got to keep Megan happy. We don't want Megan to get upset with us. So... If that's the case, then we'll find another one. You think? So, Megan says her sign accounts and I'll find Tumba anyway. So, thanks, Megs. That's a good vote of confidence. I think so, too. Although, Rusty doesn't feel great. I must be honest. I mean, that's why I'm a bit sort of tentative in the way that I'm driving. Rusty's feeling as though his steering rod is not well at all. And I think his steering rod is bent completely. So which it is now you can see it's not turning well at all so we're not going to be able to drive rusty much further at this stage we're gonna to have to try and get ourselves into a position where we can change is that him across the way or is that a hyena across the way hyena so there's, if there's a hyena around then maybe our leopard is also around but there's definitely hyena cross. But like I say, our steering rod is bent completely. So the tires are facing a very odd angle and it's gonna be very difficult for me to even get anywhere remotely safe out of this bush. And I don't know how I'm actually gonna do it, but we're gonna try. So, let's see. No, not going to work. Riti, you say we must try and put my leopard tracking pirate patch on. No, we can't go anywhere. Megan, you're going to have to link away to somebody else because the steering rod is completely bent, which means that we're not going to be able to go any more than where we are now. The tire just keeps kicking out because of the uneven terrain. It keeps separating. And actually, this is the same place that Byron had a bent steering rod. And Rusty felt odd from the moment we got into him. It felt as though there wasn't quite something right. And so what happens is the steering rod bends and then the wheels turn out and then the car just pulls in opposite direction. So both wheels push outward and you just can't turn. You can't go anywhere other than in a straight line and even a straight line it will try and pull you into different directions but we can look at our hyena while we're sitting here and while we try and get hold of Opa to come and help us because that will be at least a while and our hyena is watching me kind of from the other side of twin dams and I'm 100% sure that this hyena is coming to investigate what's going on maybe it's heard us off-roading and has now decided who is here I see it sniffing maybe little Tumba has a carcass somewhere around this area but while we try and sort ourselves out get out of this mess let's go back to Brent in the Mara and see what luck he's had alas no leopards yet but we do have a hippo enjoying a little puddle now this hippo is probably in the puddle because there's too much competition in the river at the moment so it is a male who's been pushed out of the of the river so he's probably been sleeping in the shade of the, the forest and now he's come out for a little wallow in the mud hey big man you look like you're enjoying that a lot but we're going to keep on because i got some good news i'm not going to tell you what it is but somewhere close by there is something feline Let us see if we can find it. Ow. Somewhere around here, I see quite a lot of hyenas. 
Oh dear. Now, it seems like Tristan has uh, bent his steering rod. I know all about that, Tumor. Now, let's see if Tristan's able to fix it in the field. That's the trick. There are a lot of hyenas out here. But that's not what we're looking for. There's a whole bunch of hyenas over here. Now, I'm looking for a bunch of vultures. And something feline. Now, I'm sure I'm going to get flack for this, but uh, tell Tristan that a Tumburti tree is a good place to straighten the steering arm. There we go. There's some hyenas out there. Let's see if they're eating anything. No, they're just saying hello to each other. Hi, hi. There's just some greeting going on. Okay, let's keep moving. I need to try and find out where these kitties are. So I say, it's quite nice to be down here. I haven't been down here for a, a month or so, maybe even a bit longer. I see, I think I see vultures over there in the distance. I'm still waiting. I am going to find a leopard in this area one of these days. Could it be today? Oof, hyenas everywhere. James would like to know if I've seen any leopard behavior that I would think is very specific to this area. I haven't, James, actually. Um, they've pretty much behaved like leopards. Um, I haven't seen any specific behavior. I've heard about some behavior about a big male that hangs around the crossings and um, actually will fight with crocodiles for um, carcasses, but I haven't seen that. Um, and I think that was last year. No one has really seen him around the crossings this year. Okay. No vultures that way, so it must be this way. See, I'm, I'm being quite clever. I'm sticking against the edge of the trees, which has uh, given us a lovely break from that howling gale that we had a bit earlier. The trees seem to be soaking up most of the wind. But as I said, as we get later into the day, the wind should die down and it's going to be a spectacular evening. Must be a little bit further. This the Ngama guide said somewhere around this corner was the kitty cat. Now, uh, which kitty cat could it be? So, one thing about coming to this side of the the Northern Triangle is you're committed because there's a massive marsh between us and the other side. So you're either that side or this side. There's no sneaking across in a hurry. It looks like we committed to the right side today. I see vultures up ahead. Okay, let's hang on, let's see. So the vultures are up ahead. So what is here? You almost need a drum roll in. 
What have we got? What have we got? Craig, should we show them what they're? I don't know. Maybe we should just look at the, the view. Let's not have a look what's under the vultures. Oh, I don't know. Craig, what do you think, Craig? Oh, let's, let's have a look at the, the marsh. Let's have a look at the marsh. Oh, look how pretty the marsh is. There's some woolly neck stalks in there and some Egyptian geese. Oh, we're getting close. I got the vultures up in the tree. Oof, the sun is very bright. So, what could it be? And can we even find it is the question. onto the corner here. There's more vultures just around the corner. Oh, there we go. <laughs> now, I'm just going to warn that this could be a little bit upsetting. Um, I don't know if we can find it, but from what we heard, a single lioness grabbed a baby eland, but mom is still hanging around. And possibly trying to defend the carcass. It looks like the lioness might have moved away. But the eland looks like it might be trying to defend the carcass from the vultures and and the ground hornbills by the looks of things. Okay. I'm not sure exactly where it is, but I mean, this, the vultures are here. I don't see the lion at the moment. And there it looks to be the mother eland. Ground hornbills are just passing through. And there's no sign of vultures feeding, so the lioness might still be on the carcass somewhere. We just might have missed her. Reggie's wondering, would ground hornbills feed on carcasses? They might peck at a carcass. Uh, you know, probably more interested in the maggots and things that would be in a carcass than the carcass itself. But yes, they would. They would. They would scavenge on carrion. I'm just going to go back towards that little um, old extinct corner of the Mara River we went past and have a closer look around there. So we got vultures from there to there. Lots of mud around here, so we're not going to venture off the road at all. Whoa! Oh, hold on. You guys okay? And so I said, lots of mud and big holes around here. There we go. So I'm too busy trying to find the lion and not watching where I'm driving. If I was a lion, I'd drag it down towards some shade. Okay, guys, while we try to find out where this... Well, in any next hole, lioness is. That's why I need to concentrate. Um, let's go across to Taylor, who's driving around. I'm now looking with binoculars. I'm not actually driving. Oh, an aeroplane. 
It's not actually what I was looking at. I was looking at something in the grass. But um, it turned out to be a termite mound because there are many of them around here. Now this is still the area that the Egyptian goose pride like to hang around in. So we're just carefully scanning. I haven't been at their two favorite watering holes. So I said to David that I'll point it out to you quickly. Down over there, there's a nice lush green spot with some shrubs and rocks. Those are zebra. Those are not shrubs and rocks. <laughs> Tommy. There we go, into the right hand corner. <laughs> Sorry. That's where also the lions could be. That's one of their favorite spots up there. Maybe with all the wind, they'd be um, lying about trying to keep out of the wind. But there's food around, as Darby showed you the zebra. There's also a buffalo. I'm, I'm trying to head towards the herds of buffalo because they seem to be quite large, but they're a little bit around and a bit to the north, but we'll get there eventually. But it's lovely, but very quiet so far. This is probably one of the quietest days I've had out in the Mara, but it's okay. Goodness. <laughs> Our car's a bit sick. So every now and then it lets out a, a jet of black smoke. What? Uh, I, I was convinced that termite mound was moving for a minute wasn't um what are we gonna do okay so we're not gonna go down this way because that's where there's no signal and there's a few topi we can't break some so just alone problems as you have Oh, hello. You've caught me eating my afternoon snack and still trying to find this lioness. Sorry about that. The Eland keeps looking in to that area, but I think the lion has dragged the carcass down to where we can't get to it, unfortunately. Shame, poor Mama Eland. See, we've just moved a little bit away from the trees and now the wind is catching us. Oh, okay, well, I don't think we're going to be able to see the line. She's pulled it right down in there. One last little squiz. No, nah, I think she's down. Well, there's that. There's the hole we hit earlier while I was looking for the, um, if looking for the lion. Nasty. Lots of that stuff around here. Okay, moving on. Now, many months ago, when we were still in that wet season, Dave and I came along here and uh, we nearly got stuck a few times. It was quite some tricky driving to get through. But luckily, since then, the Mara Conservancy has made the road a little better. So last time, Dave and I actually crossed up there in that muddy section there. I had to go quite quickly, but um, fortunately now, this is where the swamp, the Samaki Swamp drains and eventually flows down into the Mara River. Uh, the Mara Conservancy have kindly built us rock bridges since then. So there we go, you can see slightly bumpy and uncomfortable, but I'd rather have bumpy than uncomfortable than stuck in the mud. Oh, we got some lovely sacred ibis up ahead. All feeding on the peripheries of the swamp. Oh, and here a fish eagle in the forest behind us. Here 
you know, busy, busy birds. Light is just gorgeous this evening. It's almost able to forgive the wind with this gorgeous light. I think sunset's going to be something quite special tonight. Alas, no luck on the lion or the, or the leopard this afternoon, but we are live, so that luck could change in a split second as we continue up and around along the edge of the Mara River. Yeah, he has the next rock bridge. Now, Robert is wondering, how are the smaller animals affected by the migration? Snakes, honey badgers, etc. Uh, some of them actually, fight, well, the migration affects quite heavily. Um, something like a honey badger is quite happy with the migration because of all the dung and dung beetles. And honey, one of our honey badger's favorite foods is, of course, dung beetle larvae, so they're quite happy by it. Um, but, um, I mean, we actually saw a, a porcupine the one night that had been trodden on and trampled by a stampeding herd of wildebeest that were being chased by lions. So, uh, there are instances like that where uh, some of the smaller animals are affected negatively, but I think the migration's been going on for so long that most of those animals are quite used to it and know how to avoid uh, being stamped upon by millions of hooves. Because if you think about it, there's about 1.6 million wildebeest, but there's uh, four hooves on each of those. So a lot more hooves than wildebeest. There's some more unlucky hippos uh, having to eke out an existence in the luggers to avoid the big dominant bulls uh, along the river where all the ladies are. There we go. They just look like boulders, but of course those boulders have teeth and can chop you in half. Lazy hippos. What are you so upset about? You know, attack me, you cheeky blooming lapwing. So obviously there's a, a wattle lapwing nest around here. And the thing dive bombed us in the car. So it's obviously got a nest, very upset. Okay, I don't want to upset you, wattle lapwing. I'll move along. Just don't come in from behind and whack me on the back of the head. Uh, I've never been whacked by a lapwing before, but um, I've been whacked by starlings. Uh, actually, one starling once drew blood on my dad. So on our family farm, I used to have to go turn on the water pump to fill up the water tanks. And red winged starlings were nesting in that room where the water pump was. And it, it became quite the gauntlet to try to turn on the water pump. You should have ran in and flicked the switch and ran out. And they'd dive bomb you. Um, very aggressive around their nest starlings. Kristen is wondering, do you have any invasive bird species in the Mara? Not that I've seen. Um, in Kenya, yes, uh, in Nairobi, Mombasa, and on the coast, the Indian house crow is a very bad invasive bird species that kills a lot of other birds, and in particular their babies. Uh, but I haven't seen any in the Mara as of yet. 
So, Craig, I'm going to let you make a decision, left or right? Left. Okay, so we're definitely going to go right. I'm only joking, Craig. Uh, I see a bunch of cars up there. I think the Ngamas might be here. So we've managed to circumvent the Samaki Swamp. So we're now heading towards uh, the river or the stream or the lugger that flows into the swamp, the Sheni Lugger, and that actually sources right next to our camp. And, and that's the main feeder into the, into the Sheni Swamp is that, that lovely ravine that's below final control. Oh, what have we got up there? Bethany would like to know where does the Mara River end? Uh, it flows into Tanzania, uh, at very close to the Purungat Bridge. It then takes a sharp turn to the west and flows through the Lamai Wedge, and eventually it ends up in Lake Victoria. So one could argue that the Mara River becomes the Nile River. Because of course Lake Victoria is the source of the White Nile, not the Blue Nile. And the source of the Blue Nile is of course the Ethiopian Highlands. Now Craig and I were actually chatting a little bit earlier. I am dead set on an adventure uh, to Uganda to go white water raft on the Nile River. I think that'll be lots of fun. I say I have white water raft to the Zambezi. So I think the Nile's next on the list. Christy is wondering how much water normally accumulates in a year. Well, it's difficult to, to judge, but um, the mean annual rainfall around here is about 1,200 millimeters per year. Uh, to give you an example, uh, Juma's average mean annual rainfall is about 350 millimeters per year. So we get close on 1,000 millimeters more than the Sabi Sands. There's only one place I've lived in in Africa that gets even more rain than that. And that is, of course, the Congo Basin forests in Gabon, where you can get over 2,000 millimeters a year. Uh, what's 2,000 millimeters? Over two meters. So more water than me. Oh, there's lots of elephants here. Hello, elephants. Lovely herd. Now, the elephants really like these areas. So you'll see the trees up ahead, and that's where that stream I was talking about that flows from final control ends basically and then the water spreads out through this grassland and seeps down towards the Samaki Marsh and of course at the top end where the water first hits there's also a lot of silt that's washed down from the escarpment so very rich in nutrients so very good soils so the grass here is spectacular and you often get the elephants congregating on these areas where these um, streams spill out into the grassland Jean is wondering what is the rainfall like in the dry season in the Mara? Well, it's, 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 it's wetter than the wet season at Juma. Let's just uh, put it that way. So it's a seriously big group of Ellie's here. Lovely, there's a big bull there. Wonderful. Now, elephants taking advantage now that the wildebeest have uh, left. Uh, chatting to Jamie, who's on the other side. So there's still quite a lot of wildebeest around the Sand River. Hey guys, getting that lovely nutritious green grass. And 
there's a big ball coming through to the right there. A little bit there, you look at him, you can see the massive size difference between a male and female elephant. Nice set of ivory on him. Probably around 35, 40 years old. So very much in his prime. I'm just going to move up ahead to where the elephants are moving towards and then we'll sit there for a while and maybe even just take a moment to just enjoy this incredible experience of a massive herd of elephants walking past you. Doing quite a bit of waving as we get to the spot I want to be in. To be in. How are you, sir? Jambo. Jambo, how Ah, safi, safi. Kabisa sana. Toalini, bado kidogo. Vichwe moja, but I'm not safi kare na laga apa chini sana. Hi guys. Yes, we're live right now. Can you believe it? So there's people watching behind us. Yes. Well, well, thank you. Well, there we go. Um, so don't forget if you're going to be home at the end of the month. 29th. 29th. Exactly, and every day. Six hours a day on YouTube, you can find us. Great. Well, we watched you guys and the other two. Yes, yeah. They're, they're, well, they're around somewhere out there. Yeah. 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 So our camp's actually on top of the hill over there. So that's where we stay. Oh. That's what I thought. Nice to finally see you. Lovely to meet you guys as well. My name is Brent. Yes. The one who's always covered in shookas. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It gets really cold when you sleep out there all night. <laughs> so here we go, guys. We're meeting some Safari Live fans. So we are live currently at the moment um, on YouTube, and people are asking us questions on hashtag Safari Live. So when you get home, be sure to watch us again. <laughs> uh, wonderful. Thanks very much, Mum. Well, that's really nice to you. It's lovely to meet you guys. I'm going to take everyone else in a game drive and go okay, pop okay. over there. <laughs> exactly. Cheers, guys. Santa's there. Bye. Oh, sorry about that, everyone, but you know, the fans call. <laughs> Hi, guys. <laughs> okay, I'm just trying to get... It was a very... There he is. There's the cute baby Ellie I was looking for. Tiny little guy. So it seems like Tristan's broke his car, Taylor's fighting gremlins, so you're stuck with Batman and I. There we go, there's a tiny little one amongst the legs there that I wanted to show you. Now, Louis is wondering, what is the maximum size of an elephant? Size for a very big male um, is probably around six tons. The largest body size of an elephant ever recorded um, was nine tons. So 9,000 kilograms of an elephant bull from southern Angola. So that is the largest that generally the largest oh, that's what's going on behind us there's some talking the largest um uh, the, the tallest sorry not the largest not the heaviest um but uh, on average not always but uh, often the tallest uh elephants are considered to be from south africa um and from particular from the coastal plain um uh, from the tembe elephant reserve and uh, some of them can reach close to five meters at the shoulder so very very big It's 
So there we go. So I wanted to show you that baby, but the rest of the herd looks like it's about to head straight towards us. And it's, as I said, it's a lovely big herd. There we go. Hello, guys. Christy's wondering, do elephants sneeze? Um, indeed they do. I have seen an elephant sneeze on occasion. Uh, not quite what we'd expect. Um, it doesn't really sound like a sneeze, but instead do sort of expel an irritants from inside their trunk. As I said, I should be moving slowly towards us. And uh, I think this is probably the best seat in the house where we are at the moment. And hopefully they're going to sort of engulf us. It is a very special experience being surrounded by elephants. Now, of course, it can be a very scary experience um, if you get the situation wrong and you read the situation wrong. And uh, But fortunately, I'm quite confident watching this elephant behavior that they are very relaxed. And I think we're in for a treat now. That was complaining elephant to elephant. That had nothing to do with the vehicles or us. Um, it was an elephant complaining at an elephant. Now, there's a whole range of vocalizations that elephants use um, for different things. I mean, there's even sort of a weaning one. So when an elephant calf's being weaned, there's sort of a from a mom saying, no more milk. Um, and there's distress. Uh, there's joy, there's play, um, so they're absolutely fascinating animals and definitely one of the more complex wild animals in terms of social structure and their verbal communications. Snazzy is wondering, do elephants and giraffe get along? Uh, well, they don't not get along. And there's very little competition between them, and so they pretty much just ignore each other. Sometimes it's quite nice to just sit quietly and enjoy and um, it's a little one and a little one suckling. a peaceful evening. So Chris and Mallory from Texas are wondering what is my most endangered and dangerous encounter uh, with elephants as a guide? Well, it actually wasn't while I was guiding. I've had a few close calls, but never guiding guests. Um, I've had some close calls running anti-poaching and then doing some consulting in the Gabonese rainforest. I was actually picked up and thrown into a tree by a female elephant in Gabon. Uh, it wasn't her fault though, she was being scared by a big helicopter and she got a fright and she ran towards and I had uh, some volunteers with me and I tried to get them out of the way and when I tried to stop her charge by shouting at her, um, she picked me up and threw me into a tree and that's why I've got a gammy hip and uh, and then when she was coming down to sort of kneel on me I had my fishing rod with me in a cover and uh, probably one of the only people in the world and say a fishing rod saved my life and a fishing rod indeed saved my life so what happened is as she came down I hit her with the 
with the, the fishing rod in a, in a PVC case and the rattle of the rods is, is a noise that she was unused to and, and it disturbed her and she then ran away uh, and then had a dislocated hip and then had to use a stick to walk about six kilometers to the beach where a helicopter could pick me up and take me to uh, a doctor. That's my most, uh, my most dangerous uh, situation with elephants and it wasn't their fault, it was the, the helicopter's fault. Uh, the first thing I did afterwards when I got back um, was immediately go walk, walk straight up to an elephant on foot to make sure I wasn't scared of them. Fortunately, I wasn't. Uh, Robin is wondering what is the best way to deal with an angry elephant? Uh, Robin, it completely depends. Every situation um, is different. So uh, you, you have to read each individual situation. Sorry, I'm just putting my jersey on. It's getting a bit cold. Um, each individual situation differently. So there is no one right way. There's multiple ways and, and it can change depending on the day, the circumstance, where you are, what stress the elephant's under, what stress you're under. So it's very important not to make one set rule um, when it comes to those type of situations. You must be able to do flexible, but uh, the most important thing is always just stay calm. Now, I'm trying to remember, there is a, there is a safari live story out there somewhere of um, how to deal with a naughty elephant. Um, and. Uh, I think I, I generally give them a good talking to. They like listening to me, or they listen, tend to listen to me. If they misbehave, I chastise them, give them a, a wagging finger. Hello, little one. Paul would like to know how far will an elephant travel to get to good grassland? Now, Paul, it, it completely depends, again, on the area. So elephants in more arid areas like Savo will, will travel bigger distances than elephants in the Mara. The elephants in the Mara tend to be quite residential and they, they, they stick around certain areas. It's only really when the wildebeest come in en masse that they'll move up towards the escarpment and into the forests. And that's more to avoid the absolute pandemonium that is caused by millions of wildebeest stamping around being absolute nanas. So it all it all depends as I say every situ every area is different. Um, elephants in Botswana can travel over a hundred kilometers uh, and that's not so much for grazing but for water. So again arid areas elephants will tend to move further so when the when the the rain pools dry out and in a place where you you don't get rain during the wet season I mean, during the dry season, they will then move on to the permanent water holes or permanent rivers. So, and sometimes that can be 100 kilometers. So, uh, good examples of that is um, uh, northern Botswana, the Luangwa Valley in Zambia, um, the Salu in, 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 in Tanzania, uh, and I'm sure Savo in Kenya, uh, and Samburu. So, it, it, it all depends. Each area has got its whole own unique set of circumstances. And those circumstances can change from year to year. Absolutely gorgeous. Proud cat mama of two is wondering what is the average size of their tusks? Um, um, well, it oh, look, there's two over there, Craig, that are being quite friendly. Now it completely depends, and again, a lot of area uh, area specific behaviour uh, and area specific genetics. Ooh, you heard that. So what you'll find in the Mara is elephants tend to have much longer tusks, sometimes thinner but longer. You don't find nearly as many broken tusks as you would in, in, in Juma. And that's again 
a product of the habitat they're in. So here, where they don't eat a lot of trees, the majority of their food is made up of lovely lush grasses. Uh, they don't need to use their tusks as much uh, to, to strip bark and to push down trees and break branches. So you find a lot less broken tusks here and a lot more sort of even tusks. Uh, where there is a tumor, uh, you will find a lot more broken tusks. In Botswana, you find very short, stumpy, thick tusks. Oh, look through that gap through there. Is that the same big male? That looks bigger. No, it's the same guy. Just another lovely big elephant bull. Speaking of tusks, there he is. He, he's got lovely tusks. Hey, big boy. These elephants are really enjoying this lush grass here. Kristen's wondering, have I ever seen elephant tusks that cross each other? Actually, I've seen a few elephant females in the Mara whose tusks cross each other. So, um, yes, it does happen from time to time. And again, it's very particular to different areas. You, you're generally only going to find that in an area where the elephants aren't utilizing their tusks too much um, to strip bark and wear trees, where they have this absolutely amazing grassland um, to feed off. Because, of course, there's a lot more nutrients in grass than in trees. Um, and a perfect example here, you'll probably find nearly 80% of an elephant's year-round diet here is grass and only 20% made up of bushes and trees and shrubs where there is somewhere uh, like Juma uh, the wet season uh, diet of an elephant is 80% grass 20% trees and then the dry season uh, it inverts uh, to about 80% trees and bushes and only 20% uh, grass. Now that, uh, of course, those are very general figures. They, uh, in certain areas, that there will be quite a bit of variance on that. Kathy is wondering: Do baby elephants use their trunk to nurse? No, they don't, Kathy. They'll actually. Um, tuck their t trunk over their head, and uh, they will suckle directly from their mouth. Okay, well, I think we're going to leave these lovely ellies. We've had such a wonderful time here. Uh, let's go see what else we can find. Mm, lions, lions, lions. Which way? Let's go this way. So here's this the stream that comes from right in front of final control. There's actually two of them that join. This is how it empties out, and that's why there's so much nice grass here. And you can see that. So this is what we would refer to as a lugger. See, it's just flowing little trickles. Now, of course, the, the high water table here, um, it's flowed for most of the year. There was only about a month or two when this wasn't flowing. Whee! Splash! There's this young bull elephant I saw a few days ago. And I mean, he's not even, I'd say he's like 17, 18, and he's already got some seriously long ivory on him. So when he gets bigger, I think he's going to be quite the impressive young, well, or young bull. He's already quite impressive.
Hey, you. So you can see already that ivory is already very long. Isn't that lovely? So young and already such lovely ivory. So Karsten in Denmark is saying, if you find a broken tusk, do you leave the tusk there or do you uh, pick it up? Uh, generally, Karsten, uh, it is illegal to pick up ivory in Africa. You can go to jail for a long time. Uh, what we normally do is you'll, you'll either GPS mark it, hide it, and uh, then give it to the local rangers. So if you are ever in Africa and you do find a piece of ivory do not pick it up leave it where it is if you do pick it up you are likely to go to jail and uh, most African jails well no jails are pleasant but African jails are especially unpleasant um, in certain parts of Africa so don't pick up ivory <laughs> just leave it be so there we go you can see okay let's go find some lions What do you think, Craig? Lion time. Bye, guys. So we're getting that that part, that time of the day uh, where we are able to be the only car out in the Mara. Um, so just a quick update for everyone. Taylor is fighting off some gremlins. Alex is on it. Uh, he's trying to figure it out. And um, Tristan is under the car, apparently. So. Um, hopefully, hopefully one of them will be out soon and helping us out. But till then, as I say, you're with the Batman and myself. I just want to have a quick stop around here and a quick listen. And there's a bird I'm hankering to show you that I've heard calling in this little bit of forest um, off to the left here. And let's just stop and listen for a second. And uh, the sun is starting to set. So it's gone behind the escarpment now, so it's going to be a while till um, we get that lovely orange color, but I'm sure it's coming. Isn't it just the most gorgeous evening? We can hear some Franklins calling. So we get some of this similar Franklin species here. And, uh, and, uh, 
I'm going to see if we can find them. So that's a red-necked Franklin or one of the red-necked Franklins calling. Now I'm going to go see if we can find the Angama Pride back up towards camp and around their favorite lugger. While we do that, it seems like Alex, our Russian genius, has got Taylor up and running again. So let's go see how Madam McCurdy is doing. Welcome back. So um, maybe uh, Madam McCurdy's uh, got no sound, so you are still with us. Um, but we're having a great time, so let's carry on. Well, it's the Brent and Batman show today. So what I'm doing is I'm heading back towards, I know the Ngamas were around one of their, their favorite sort of lugger um, this morning, but there's a lot of zebra up towards the escarpment. And we've been having such wonderful sightings of them there. So I'm hoping as it gets darker, they're gonna come up towards the escarpment and start hunting. Now, I have got a quiz for all of you, and I know I've talked about it on Drive um, a few times in the past. So, here we go. I would like to know who was the first man to walk from Cape Town to Cairo. And uh, he's actually very, very much connected to Kenya. So, I um, thought it was a fitting question. So, who was the first man to walk from Cape Town to Cairo? I'll tell you why he walked from Cape Town to Cairo. So, uh, he was a, a poor, lowly, uh, well, he wasn't born to the upper crust of society, uh, but he fell in love with a, a lovely young lady who was from the upper crust of society. So, he decided he had to marry this lady and went to see her dad, and her dad basically scoffed him and said the only way you will marry my daughter is if you walk from cape town to cairo so he did and he did marry her so well it seems like jamie has um up and about and uh, she's uh, manning the river cam so let's go see what's happening there i am indeed and what perfect timing look at that hopefully that's not um that what the hippo's opinion is on my narrating for this evening of the river cams but a very good evening to all of you i am sitting manning the river cams up at the top of the ololo escarpment and of course the river cams providing us with the most extraordinary view of the wildlife that this area has to offer and of course during the migration of the crossings as well no go up camera go up oh no up the other up ah oh. This isn't working at all. For those of you wondering about the disembodied voice that is emanating from your screens, my name is Jamie, and I happen to know why said person walked from Cape to Cairo. I know because I hear that story about once a week. And the reason that he did, of course, was to win the heart of a lady, or at least win the heart of the lady's father, I believe, or win the permission that he was going to need. Right, let's see if we can move the camera. Yes, we can. Of course, as most of you know, we have had a substantial amount of rain here in the Mara over the course of the last week or so, and we've been neglectful of our river cameras because all three of us have been really rather busy and we haven't had time to sit up uh, ensconced in the studio. I wonder how James would feel. I might go and move some of his stuff around just to see if he notices, hide something somewhere, just to see. He is away, of course, for a, the duration of two weeks. But the rain, if we have a look at the Mara River, I don't think I've ever seen it as full as it is at the moment. Manu and myself, Manu, of course, being one of our cameramen, 
he was out with me for two days and we drove back over the Burungat Bridge yesterday. Oh no, this morning. Oh, it feels like yesterday. This morning. And it was extraordinary just how high the Mara River is. Just look at this. Some of you might be familiar with this view. It is a main north crossing. We often see wildebeest cross, wildebeest and zebra crossing around here. And if they don't cross here, they cross over there. Oh, this camera doesn't want to go up. It doesn't want to go up. Oh, no. Okay, over there in the background. I know now we're focused on the tiny bush. But in the background over there is main south crossing. Imagine what it would look like now. Imagine what these poor wildebeest would have to go, to, go through in order to get across this river. I have never, ever seen it like this. It's actually quite extraordinary. Well, since our yawning hippos disappeared, let us do some scanning around and see if we can find anything on Maine South, since Maine North is really being rather difficult. So if we could have a quick switch across to uh, the Maine South camera. Baby, please, please, I beg of you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chantel. So there we go. This is Maine South. There we go. And this is, of course, where the Paradise Pride enjoy spending a great deal of their time. They hide in the thickets and the rocks over here. Now, of course, they have no reason to do that at the moment because the crossings aren't happening right now. I can tell you that the wildebeest are... Mm, there's not that many of them on the opposite side of the river. We drove around there two days ago. And there's a lot more a bit further to the south. If we look to the south, we can't see Lookout Hill, of course, from this vantage point. But a bit further to the south, there are many thousands of wildebeest that are starting to gather around the Lookout crossings. And a good evening to James. Is that a hippo? Is that a rock? Are we going to get lucky? Is it a... Is that a hippo? Is that a rock? It's a rock. It's a hippo rock. I'm not sure. Let's have a look. Let's keep watching it. Everybody, try, try and take some deep breaths. It could... Oh, there's a crocodile at least. Oh, thank goodness. Oh, Jamie's out of practice with the river cam. Jamie apologizes. There you go. It was a rock, but it is also a crocodile off on the left. James, in terms of the species in the morrow that become more prominent, I'm going to have to say the insects. I, I think... Look, look, look above the water. Look really closely. I don't know if you can see it. I can see it. You can actually see thousands and thousands of insects blowing around there. That, little midges flying about over the surface of the water. So insects, I think that really, really goes without saying. That applies across the board. I, of course, saw the one hedgehog, which I feel like might have been a, as a result of the rain because it came out foraging looking for various things to catch. Otherwise, the animal life remains pretty much the same in terms of what we see out here. And it just goes to show, we always talk about the when we watch the crossings, just how much death there is involved. But now look at this, look at this particular co crocodile sitting quietly, waiting, and this could be its life for the next couple of months until the wildebeest return once again. So they do really have to take full advantage. Bethany, you want to know what our best sighting has been <clears throat> on the river camera? There have been so many uh, to actually try and work out. I had one where we just missed a lion kill, and then we had one where we actually managed to see, we, we, we saw her emerge out of the bushes and grab a young wildebeest calf. Those moments are extraordinary because they're just so unexpected. I would also say that the, the baby zebra walking across the back of the crocodile, <clears throat> that to me will always be my favorite. I really, really, uh, you can't help, uh, you shouldn't really take sides, but you can't help but be on the side of the zebra foal crossing the river for the first time, the raging torrent of the Mara River. And this actually really is a raging torrent. And the fact that the little zebra foal walked across the back of the crocodile and made it across to the opposite bank safely, I think it's safe to say that was my favorite sighting. I'd love to hear from you, of course, to those of you that have been watching our river crossings when we've gone live. Do you have a particular favorite sighting that you've enjoyed? Sometimes I, I confess the human part of me has struggled with the 
with the crossings, particularly when the poor wildebeest struggle and they drown. It's just, I find it quite, I've found it quite distressing at times. Uh, if I can get cul-de-sac to focus, hold on one moment. I'm going to show you something else, something interesting. Come on. Focus. Ah, oh, it's just too close. I was going to try and show you the poison apple that's growing at cul-de-sac crossing, but it's not really working. <clears throat> All right, so... We will be starting a school drive this evening. Obviously, as you know, it's something that we all really enjoy doing here, both in the Mara and in Juma, sharing these amazing sites with various children and basically letting them know what's out here in the, the big, vast spaces of the African wilderness. It really is a special thing. What that means is that we will be focusing on the questions of the kids. The drive will continue as normal, though, so it's not a farewell to all of you. It's just simply we will be focusing on the questions that the kids send through to us. So I'm going to say not goodbye, but a cut, call and end to our regular drive, and we will be starting off our school drive this evening. Welcome everybody and of course a big welcome to all the wonderful children who are joining us from Monroe Elementary. It's good to have you this afternoon. My name is Taylor and bringing you all the fantastic wildlife on this vehicle is David. And wasn't that a beautiful sunset that we've just seen? Now remember because this is happening right now in Kenya, in Africa, it means that you can ask us questions. So you just have to ask your teacher the questions and then she will send them to us and then I can answer any questions that you have. But it's quite dark now. The sun has already dropped behind the horizon, leaving beautiful colors in the sky, don't you think? Looks like someone's got hold of a paintbrush of sorts. Now we have a tricky step ahead of us and that is to try and do a 37 point turn. Because in these big safari cars, they're not the easiest to turn. It's definitely no sports car. Now, we're out here. We're actually quite close to the Mara River. And we're going to have a look at some of the river points. We'll have to bring the spotlight out soon, though. But it's good. I think you've joined us at a very nice time. Even though we haven't found any lions yet, this is the time of the day that they get on the move. So we could see many different animals, from lions to hyenas to leopards. They like to live along the rivers and in the drainage lines. We could see jackals, which are, look like a fox. We could see there's so many different nocturnal animals out here. Uh, this is a very exciting time. This is one of my favorite times. It's just as the sun has set. It is so beautiful. So we'll go and check a few favorite spots of lions that we have seen over the past couple of days along the river. See, normally at this time of the year, there's big herds of wildebeest crossing the Mara River heading south back to the Serengeti, but they've already done so very early this year, which makes me a little bit sad because this is my first time up in Kenya and I thought the animals were going to put on a show for me. But things don't go according to plan, especially out here with nature. The animals do what they want when they want. Who have we got running on the ground? Who on earth is that? Oh, <gasps> bat-eared foxes! No ways! Do you know how lucky you are to see these creatures? Oh my goodness, I cannot believe it. I've been seeing them all the time. Now they're very shy, they're very elusive. You can see they're running away. That's amazing. I thought that they would have been jackals, but this is even better. Now they're probably trying to get away from us. We're actually quite far away, so hopefully they settle down. We've stopped the car now. Oh, but they get reactive at this time. See, so they're nocturnal, so they don't like to come out during the day. They prefer this crepuscular period, so just as the light starts to, to dip. That's amazing. And then you'll see there's an antelope, a Thompson's gazelle. Well, not antelope, a gazelle, sorry. There we go. But they're not worried about those little creatures. They won't be eating anything as large as a Thompson's gazelle. They prefer little insects, and they'll catch mice and things when they can, but they mainly feed on insects. And there's lots of grasshoppers around at the moment after all the rain. So I'm sure they'll be digging for them. They'll dig for grubs and beetles in the soil. 
But now they're really just worried about getting away from us. That's amazing. That's the first time I must tell you that I've put bat-eared foxes on screen. So you are all very, very lucky. And I know the regular viewers will be ex absolutely ecstatic. Ecstatic about that sighting, but we're dedicating the next 45 minutes to all of you at school, and I can't wait for some of your questions. But now we're going to go across to my friend Brent, and he has got quite a large mammal that normally spends most of its day in the water. That's right, and this is a hippopotamus who does spend most of his day in the water. And that's the very cool thing about being out as it gets dark. You get to see things like those bat-eared foxes that Taylor just showed you. And, uh, of course, now we get to see a hippo out of the water. And you can actually see how big they are. And they're eating grass, so they spend their days in the water. Then they come out to munch on the grass. Now, I'm looking for lions around here. And uh, a big welcome to Munro Elementary. My name is Brent, and it's getting very exciting because it's about to get dark. So we could see some very cool things. Lions, hyenas, servals, civets, genets, all the little nocturnal creatures that are about to get out. So I think the lions are close, close around here somewhere. And um, there's a big pride of lions around here that really like this area. So... I, I can hear a jackal, which is very similar to a coyote, and it was alarm calling. It was going, row, 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 which means when they alarm call, they've seen something that's bigger and scarier than them, like a lion. So I'm going to move towards, there's a little river just over there, and the lions like to spend a lot of time there. So I'm hoping as it gets darker, and we're going to find them coming out and getting on the move. Now, another exciting thing is that the next time you see us, we're going to have some very cool technical equipment to use out on the safari. We've got some infrared lights which enable us to see in the dark. And we've even got a FLIR thermal camera and that will enable us to pick up no, we don't have a flare. My, my cameraman is saying, no, we don't have a flare. Sorry, I thought we had a, a flare. We don't. So we'll have a flare tomorrow, I think. There we go, nod from the cameraman. Um, but we've got some infrared equipment and a special low light cameras that will enable us to see things in the pitch black. And that enables us to see a lot of the really, really cool nocturnal animals you don't really get to see too often. I've got to say, this time of the day, I call it the changing of the guards. It's one of my favorite times of the day. So all the birds that have been making noise during the day, they start going silent. And the nighttime birds and the nighttime bugs start making noise. And the frogs also start waking up. We can actually hear some toads. So there's lots of little patches of water around here. And you can hear them. Rah, rah, rah. Now, a toad is actually a frog it's not a different type of thing but it's called a toad because it's got a very special thing on top of its head so if you've ever seen a toad just behind its eyes there's a, a raised sort of piece of skin and there's a gland in there it's called a bufo gland and uh, it releases toxins that make other animals not eat the toads so if you've ever had a dog that has bitten a toad, they start frothing in the mouth and they can't actually kill it. And that's from those toxins. It's a, a toad's defense mechanism. So Laura is wondering, what do hippos eat? Laura, as I said a little bit earlier, they spend all day in the the water and then they come out at night to eat grass so they're basically big african lawn mowers uh, go we've got next to us there she is 
This is a Maasai giraffe. And she'll probably stay in this area for the night. She might even lie down for, to have a snooze. Oh, in the tree there, we've got lots of birds about to go to sleep. Oh, they're flying up and landing. And those are called guinea fowl. So they're sort of the equivalent to a bush felt chicken. About the same size as a chicken. They run around in flocks eating grass seeds. And they spend 90% on their time on the ground. But when it gets dark, they go up into the trees to avoid the little nocturnal predators. sounds now. The crickets are starting to make noises. This is definitely my favorite time of the day. All this in sunrise. Now the reason I'm not driving at the moment is because I'm looking for lions and at this time of the day the lions start to call. There we go, giraffe having a last minute night time snack. So Tote would like to know how fast do hippos run? Faster than Usain Bolt. They can run uh, probably, oh, not probably, they can run about 55 kilometers an hour. So I'm not only listening for the big lion roars, I'm also listening for contact, contact calls. Now, what contact calls are the soft calls that lions use to talk to each other when they start getting moving. And they sound like this. Anthony is wondering, can hippos float? Anthony, unfortunately, they can't. They can't even swim. Can you believe it? Even though they live in the water. So what they do is they actually run along the bottom of the water when they have to move between places. Now, guys, I want you to do something with me. And uh, let's see. I'm going to teach you how to do a lion's roar. Are you ready? Are you guys ready? So I want everyone in the classroom to do this with me. And I will tell you what a lion says as well. So you've got to go like this. So is everyone ready? Everyone ready to roar like a lion? So you've got to go like this. I can hear a jackal alarming, so I'm going to get my spotlight out shortly. And I'm just going to teach, teach you now. What do you think that lion is saying? So lions, when they call loudly like that, they're telling all the other lions that this is their spot, their territory. So it's saying, this is my turf. Don't come here. Otherwise, I'm going to fight with you. So what a lion's actually saying, he's going, whose land is it? Whose land is it? Whose land is it? It's mine. It's mine. It's mine. So there we go. That's what a lion's saying when he's calling out there. Now, let me just get my spotlight out from me under all my blankies and stuff here. Because sometimes we stay out late at night and it gets cold. So I've got to have a blankie with me. There we go. Let's just see. I want to see if those lions are around here. So I'm going to move around. I think they're down there somewhere. So while we do that, uh, let's go see how Taylor's nocturnal travels are going. Hello? 
I've got no comms. Really? Oh. Um, Chantal, can you talk to me? Sorry, I've got absolutely no comms whatsoever. Sorry, everybody. I don't have any communication with anyone in Final Control at all. So I won't be able to answer any of your questions, unfortunately. So, and we haven't seen anything else since we saw those bat-head foxes. They ran off into the distance, but I've got my spotlight out and I'm looking for the night. I also broke my earpiece and we seem to be having some problem with our uh, infrared light. So we are being attacked by many this afternoon. It has not been very pleasant, but one of those things, hey, when you try and bring a live broadcast from the middle of Africa. So there's lots of animals we could see, but at the moment, Animals seem to be very sort of few and far between where normally we have massive big herds But they have all gone south to Tanzania. So we're not actually far from another country Which is quite cool. Let's see. So I'm going to just keep scanning here And as I scan it's important that I watch where the light goes Because if I don't then I'm going to miss the reflection of uh, the eyes of the animals and then I won't be able to find anything. So that's what I'm doing. I'm looking for the reflection of eyes. And then I'll go, okay, it's an impala, which is an antelope. I can't look at them at night. Oh, another bat fox. Are you kidding me? This is an even better view. Oh my goodness, our luck is unbelievable. Never mind seeing them running away. To see one having a drink of water too. This is unbelievable. And, qu and quite relaxed, actually. I mean, it's running now. I'll keep the spotlight on it. It doesn't mind the spotlight. That's unbelievable. <laughs> I don't even know what to say. Hey, David. I'm absolutely speechless with the luck that I've been having. And I'm so glad that I've finally been able to share it with you. Now, let's see what it's going to do. It's quite interesting. I've never spent time with a bat-eared fox before because they are so shy. So... I don't actually even know much about their feeding habits other than what I've read in books. It'll be really interesting to see how they forage. Now, they've got relatively big ears. There's an impala. That's an antelope. But they're not worried about that, that fox, like I said. They've got very, very big ears. So they'll be able to hear insects moving in the grass. They'll be able to hear insects moving below the ground. They've also got a very good sense of smell. And they'll use a combination of those senses to try and find their food. And with all the rain that we've had at the moment... The ground is nice and soft, so they, of course, will be able to get all the little beetles and things and dig down into, this, into the soil quite easily. You're so lucky. I can't tell you how lucky you are to see those beautiful creatures. But it's shy now. It's hidden in the grass. That's okay. That's not a problem. It gave us a fantastic view. So we'll carry on. That's a good idea. I don't know where my phone is, but hang on. There's a hyena. There's another nocturne, nocturnal creature. I'm so excited about that bat fox that we get to see. And it's just running now. We'll stop here. It should run into frame. Now, much bigger than that little bat fox that we saw, so they don't mind the spotlight. So this is a spotted hyena. And they are mainly known for being scavengers. So they clean up all the leftovers in the bush but they're very good hunters and here they live in really big clans so we call a group of hyenas clans they're basically family groups so it's females there it goes right so apparently i'm supposed to check my mobile device for a question let's see it's open from megan megan's oh here we go now a question from abby about the bat-eared fox and that was how fast does a bat-eared fox run Abby, unfortunately, I have no idea. I've never tested the speed of a bat-eared fox. That's uh, normally what we only see them doing is running away. But uh, I wouldn't have a clue. I don't think they can run as fast as that hyena can run. I think we might... No, that's an antelope there. Um, I would say, I'm guessing though, you can't quote me on this, Abby. I would say not more than about... At a sprint, 55 kilometers an hour. I said this the other day about a jackal, and then the jackals can run much faster. They can reach between 70 and 80 kilometers an hour. So that's fairly quick. 
and they're quite small as well. I don't think they move very quick. They don't look like they're built for speed. They'd rather just try and tuck away and hide underneath a tree or a shrub or something, or in, in, in a den in a burrow that goes underneath the ground. And David, it also looks like our lights have just decided not really to work either tonight. <laughs> What a disaster! But these are the things that happen when you're out on safari and make it more exciting. You know, Jamie, oh, Jamie has to tell you the story. One day, wait, well, Jamie's not on drive today, but when you meet Jamie, she must tell you about how she got stuck in the mud. That's always so exciting. You try and dig yourself out, or then sometimes you have to get someone to pull you out. That, that happens actually quite often. So it's actually really fun being a safari guide. You get to do the most adventurous things. And you can ask David's favorite thing to do is when the roads are nice and wet, when he's driving around, is to slip and slide. That's his absolute favorite. Dave the Drifter. That's another one. Ha <laughs> ha. What have we got there? Almost dry. So that, that termite mound, there was little eyes that were peering out at me, but they disappeared behind that little shrub, that's, that green shrub that's just in front of that termite mound. So I wonder... It was very small. It could have really been anything hiding there. No, it's now disappeared. I wonder what it could have been. We'll keep searching. Hmm, this river road seems to be very lucky tonight. Oh, white-tail mongoose! There it goes. There's another nocturnal critter. Yo, it's hiding very well, though. You can just see its eyes. It's, it's, it is there. I promise you it is there. We'll just have to wait for it to move. It's hiding in the grass at the moment. So all these animals that we're seeing at night, they can be a little bit nervous. There it goes. It's running. You see it running? So this is the largest species of mongoose that we get, and it's the nocturnal one. Most of our mongoose species actually come out at night. That's really cool. Now, uh, we won't be able to see it anymore because that grass gets too tall. But it'll also be out looking for things to eat again, like the bat eared fox. They love to eat insects, but they will also eat, they'll eat a bit of everything. Frogs. Mongoose are particularly good at eating frogs and toads. It's interesting how they do it. So they'll catch one, and, and especially if it's a toad, they have these um, parotid glands. So basically these glands that secrete a foul tasting substance so it's it's like it's a way to try and keep predators away and they'll eat around it they'll just leave them which is quite amazing how they do that uh, but they eat a little bit of everything though. I've even seen them scavenging on carcasses we saw that the other day which I didn't know that they did but the animals do what they want to eat, yeah and it depends where you go how that animal behaves so if you buy any animal behavior books Make sure you, it's about that area that you're going to see those animals in because it will be very different from somewhere else. So you have no idea how lucky you are to have seen bat eared fox, to see a white-tailed mongoose. What else are we going to see? I'd like to see an aardvark or an earth pig is the, the translation. That would be nice. We're coming to the water's edge now. This is the Mara River. We'll stop and have a quick look. There's sometimes a lion, two lions that like to hang around on the other side. So I'm not really going to put the spotlight on the hippos because they don't, it's not their favorite thing. Let's have a listen. You can actually listen to how fast the river is flowing. So some animals don't mind the light so much. Hippos are not a fan. They're all down there. You can just see them occasionally. I'll quickly show you there. I'm not going to put it on them just so you can see they're going under. We see they're going underwater because they don't like the light. So we'll keep it off them. And then when, sometimes when they're out on land, you get ones that are relaxed. And then you'll get others that just run away. Craig and I actually had two hippos run into each other last night. It was quite funny. They panicked. There were lions about. And then they just started stampeding and, well, two bumped heads. It sounded like a car crash. But it wasn't. It was just the hippos. They were both fine, though. They just shook their heads like that, and then they carried on eating, well, yeah, eating all the delicious grass. Oh, 
next one else are we gonna just lots of animals that we can't view with the spotlight unfortunately mainly gazelle And sometimes you can just drive for hours and hours and just not even see anything. David, are we still live? Now, unfortunately, final control, I can't look at my phone. Who am I linking to? Great. Wonderful. Okay, I can't look at my phone and drive, unfortunately. So, while we try and fix my communication, let's go back to... Welcome back. So, guys, I hope you guys did a good roar. I'll be very disappointed if you didn't. So, I want to know who had the best roar. Which of you had the best roar? Ooh, we've got some eyes in our spotlight. What could it be? That looked quite interesting. Let me just make sure there's nothing else around. Let's have a look. That looked like it could be. A hyena, or maybe something a bit smaller. Let's see, they're just behind this bush. Where? Oh, it's being sneaky. Whatever it is. Just have a look. Mm, no, let's go back. I think. No, no, there we go, Craig. You got the eyes there. What have we got there? That could be something very cool. Um. Here we go. Oh, it's a little reed buck. Okay, I thought it was a hyena. So reed buck are very secretive little antelope, and and that's why they sometimes move like predators. So you think sometimes they could be hyenas or, or or things like that. But I think I know where I can find a hyena. Now, as I was saying, it is very cool that we are able to drive in the Mara at night. Now, Taylor and I are the only people who are allowed to drive around with spotlights and uh, isn't that exciting so you literally never know what we might find Cheryl, who's in the Great White North, Canada. Uh, Cheryl, strange enough, we actually met a lovely couple from Canada today. Oh, yesterday, uh, while we were on drive. Um, they were from Toronto. But uh, Cheryl would like to know, what animals would I like to spend more time with out here? Oh, Cheryl, all of them. I think probably I've been really enjoying my time with Cheetah at the moment. Um, I've spent a lot of time with lions since I've been here, so I have been really enjoying my time with Cheetah. And of course, there are two wild dogs that randomly appear all around the Mara. And uh, being my favorite animal, I'd love to spend some time with them. So we've got, we got the big spotlight, but it is very heavy. It probably weighs about 10 pounds. Uh, no, maybe not. That's exaggeration. Probably about 7 or 8 pounds. Um, so it does get a little bit heavy so I've developed a new system I'm actually thinking about trying to make a mount and I can just put my hand on top of it and swivel 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 and um, so it is an incredibly good spotlight it's, it is actually designed for the front of the car uh, as a, a, a spotlight for the car but um, I like a good spotlight so we modified it to be able to use on drive so we can get some extra length while we are moving about so we can see further away and find you more animals. And I said I'm going to try to find some hyenas. I think the lions are snoozing somewhere in this river system here. Uh... Nope. 
it's a buffalo. So for those of you wondering why we don't leave the lights on any of the diurnal animals. So when I say diurnal, it means a daytime animals. Um, it's because we can blind them. Their eyes are designed differently to the nocturnal animals. So the nocturnal animals are able to, to, to take the spotlight and um, they actually, it helps their night vision. It, their, their eyes are designed to take in any ambient light from anywhere. Where there is some of the daytime animals, um, it, it can actually blind them for a short time. So um, if you see me stop and I look and I see it's a zebra or something like that, I'll take the spotlight off quickly and I'll carry on looking. So I yeah, say, so I don't need to do weights. Oh dear. Sorry, my spotlight stopped working and then I hit a hole. Oh dear. I think uh, I know exactly where the problem is. Give me 30 seconds. So now I know everyone else is having some tech problems and we have tech problems from time to time. This isn't so much a tech problem as a, as a on the spot problem. And uh, I'm gonna turn on another light here. And one of the things about being live and out in the African bush, you need to know how to fix things in a hurry. So I'm just going to, I can't turn that off. So um, as I said, this is a modified spotlight. So I, I'm waiting for some lugs. And I'm sure some of you know what a lug is there. It's something that I can join two electrical wires to together quite easily um, without them pulling out. But unfortunately, we don't have any of those in stock. They should have actually arrived while I've been on drive today. So I'll be able to make a more permanent pro uh, solution. But till then, obviously now I'm rushing because I'm feeling the pressure of the camera on me. And so I'm, I'm feeling the pressure, the camera's on me. Um, so let's have some answers from the quiz while I uh, try fix our spotlight. Ah, see, that's what happened, it got twisted. That's why it pulled out. Heidi says, a brave man. Okay. Now, what I'm doing is I'm actually twisting uh, the two positive, oh no, it's actually the two negative wires together. And um, here we go. Let us have a test before I, there we go, spotlight back. Yay. Um, Craig, do I have, uh, do we have some insulation tape, please? I did have some. And I think it has migrated to cam ops. Cam ops. Well done to Ziggy, Janet, Kiwi, and many others um, who are spot on. It was Irwat Grogan, the first man to walk from Cape Town to Cairo. So there we go. Now, just so I don't shock myself more than I normally do, and, and that's just because sometimes when I look at myself in the mirror after a long day in the bush and I see what a state my hair and my face can get in, but I mean electrical shock myself this time, I'm just going to do that quickly and just tighten that up. And don't worry, I will fix this properly tomorrow with lugs because they should have arrived from Nairobi today. But there's a, when you live out in the bush, often uh, you have to just make a plan. And fortunately, most of us here are quite good at that. Thank you, Batman. And, uh, and there we go. Spotlight fixed on the run. Let's continue. Let me turn off my, that light. So, and Voila! Now I'm, I'm quite, whoa, there's that hole, I forgot about that. So I'm quite, quite lucky, so my, my, I'm not, strange enough, the most technical human in the world. But, uh, most of my fixes and whatnot, I've just had to learn from being stuck in the middle of the bush with no one to come rescue or help you. Um, and uh, I've been very blessed with a childhood um, spent entirely in the African bush and uh, fixing spotlights and steering arms and, and, and radiators. Who knew? You know, if you've got a leaky radiator and your car's overheating, you can fix it with soap. Lots of little tricks you learn after many years in the bush. And uh, I wouldn't say I'm a good mechanic now. I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm probably barely competent, but uh, when you do get stuck out in the bush, uh, you don't have a choice. You just have to fix, or you can sometimes wait for two or three days. I think one of the more memorable 
stuck out in the bush occasions for me. I was about 18, no, 19 years old. Um, and I was working in, 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 in Zambia, in the Kifui, or in the, in the GMAs, the game management areas on the edge of the Kifui National Park. And we were heading in during the rainy season. And um, so we used to have a, a big old Bedford. Now, for some reason, I am cursed with Bedford trucks. They are horrible things. They're from World War II, and they just break down, or the four-wheel drive doesn't work properly. And the Bedford was going in. We're going in to build uh, the camp for the dry season. And uh, this Bedford, so what you call a, a dambo, uh, which is a, a type of open grassland that you find in Miombo woodland. And, um, so, and they get very, very flooded. So we were going in very early, so still during the wet season, to start building a camp in the northern Kafui. And this Bedford got so stuck in the mud. I mean, it was buried up to its axles. Um, I mean, the tires are come up to sort of over here on me and, and more than half the tire was in the mud. And uh, I was following a day or two later in my, uh, in, well, I was probably about, oh, probably about eight or nine hours behind the Bedford in a Land Cruiser. And uh, you know, at that age, you, you're full of bravado, but not much brains. And um, I saw the Bedford there. Instead of stopping and going and have a look uh, where I should cross, I just put into low range and I thought I was an absolute hero and hit speed and tried to drive around the stuck truck, which all that meant is I got stuck next to the truck. And uh, it rained again that day. And uh, <laughs> we, were, we were fortunately, we had a lot of food on the truck, but it took us four days to get that truck out. So uh, I phoned my then boss on the sat phone and I was like, well, boss, we, we're, we're stuck here and all this. He's like, well, my boy, just get yourself out and that's all you can do. So that's what we did. So it is quite wonderful and I wouldn't trade my childhood for anything in the world. I've been absolutely spoiled um, to live and work and grow up in the places I have. I know many, many people would um, cut off their left leg to have, say, oh, I grew up in the Okavango Delta, and then before that, Pinda. I've worked in Zambia, Tanzania, Gabon, um, Namibia, South Africa, and all in some of the most spectacular wildlife areas in the world. So uh, I, I do count my blessings. And uh, fortunately, my long road in the bush led me, led me to right here. So just a quick update for everyone. Unfortunately, uh, Tristan and Taylor are out. So as I said a bit earlier, um, it's the Brenton Batman show. So I'm hoping to find some hyenas in this area. Hi, Judy. Judy's wondering, do the leopards hang out closer to the tree line? Uh, indeed they do, uh, but you do find them out in the Balanite zone. It all depends on what's around, but you will find the leopards sometimes out in the grasslands. They generally prefer the little luggers or the little river systems that run and crisscross through the Mara uh, because there's a bit of cover and the animals are going to come to drink. Why go look for the animals when the animals will come to you? Now, I've seen quite a lot of leopards um, since I've been here, but often at the moment, they're in those little deep areas where we don't have the best signal. So we've often got to say, oh, aren't you a pretty kitty? And move along. Now we have, Craig and I had a, a lovely view of, um, or Batman, Craig, uh, uh, of the Magia Chafu female uh, a couple of days ago. And I still think my, my leopard highlight in the Mara is we, Dave and I had a, a male leopard go underground and pull out an adult water. That was quite spectacular and quite special. And that was also, it was live on our Facebook page when that happened. So it was very nice to be able to share it with you. And that's one of the most amazing things about what we do is being able to share all these incredible encounters we, we have with you. There's a white-tailed mongoose scuttling about there. Let me go forward a bit for you, Craig. He's just done a a runner. Where'd he go? White-tailed mongoose? Is he, where's he run off to? Oh, he's moving there. 
Poppity poppity poppity. Oh, well, our white tail mongoose is disappearing into the long. Oh, there he is, into the long grass. Now I was hoping to show you a hyena, but it seems like Taylor McCurdy has beaten me to the punch. I have, Brent, but you won earlier this afternoon. You had hyenas coming out of your ears. And it's also another animal that's got fairly large ears, but it is fast asleep at the moment. It is not ready to wake up just yet. And hopefully it will lift its head up and look towards us. But yes, now this is our second hyena. At least you got to have a good look of the one that was running next to the car. Obviously heading to something quite exciting. This one doesn't look like it's going to be heading anyway for any... There you go. Hello. Yes. We're here. Just looking back at us. And I'll probably just relax here. Maybe if there's some other hyenas that call out, they will, it will get up and it will head towards them. But for now, it is okay to relax. But they are on the go at night. We hear them around camp all the time. They're one of the most vocal animals that you'll hear from the classic... Apparently I can speak hyena to the cackling and the giggling that they make and that means all sorts of different things. But not doing too much though. And it doesn't look like it wants to hunch its jet as well. And then here's another little creature. I'm not going to put the spotlight on it properly because it doesn't like the light. But you'll get, you'll get an idea. That is a scrub hair. I'm surprised that that hyena wouldn't go for something like this because it would be a very easy meal to catch. Now it is out at night as well. They like to hide away during the day and it is grazing so they like to eat grass. Very dangerous for something so small to be out here and you can see look how nervous it is. Eats, eats and then pricks its ears up and looks around because not only a hyena would eat it but there's lots of big owls out here that would catch something like this. Jackals would go after a scrub hair too. Looks like Bugs Bunny, the shadow especially. <laughs> so it has to be very careful. All right, okay, let's carry on. Let's see what other animals are out here. We're having lots of luck tonight, which is quite nice. We're very far away from home still. We've got to go all the way down. You won't even be able to see the lights. It's so far away. But I'm surprised we haven't bumped into any lions because we've driven the different prides of lions. We've driven their favorite spots and areas, favorite trees to sit underneath. But everybody's been absent. So I don't know what the excuse is or where the lions are all gathering today. And normally Brent, he's the king of cats. So if he can't find them, phew, well then, I have no hope. Maybe someone will just walk in front of the road for us. That would be nice. Hey? We'll just cross in front of our car. That would be the best thing. Oh, there's a hippo out of the water though. Now, it's probably going to run away. Let's, have, let's see if we can quickly get a look. We're almost there. I'm just keeping the spotlight off it for now so that I don't chase it away. But it's on our right hand side. There's another car coming. Hopefully they don't drive too quickly or they maybe dim their lights and don't scare it away. Oh no, I've got no brakes. There's our hippo. Come here, duck. I'll just keep the light on it just a little bit. It's quite a big hippo, hey? See it's going down to the water now, so they come out at night to eat grass. I'm not sure if Brent told you all of this already. And then they spend most of their day during the water, or in the water. And when they get scared, they will go back to water. But I don't think that's the case yet. Looks like the hippo may have been having a little bit of a drink too. There you go. Do you feel better in there? Isn't that cool? Okay, but I'm not going to take the light off it now because it's a little bit uncomfortable with us. So we'll let it carry on. And hopefully it will just climb back out the other side. And uh, off it will go. And carry on eating all the lovely delicious grass hopefully it will stay out, out of trouble and i'm going to send you back across to brent now but it's been lovely meeting all of you and i hope that you enjoyed all the interesting creatures that we had welcome back guys um i'm still looking for hyenas or lions or anything that might be about but unfortunately i think they're avoiding me tonight but it is an absolutely gorgeous evening. Hi, Elijah. Elijah would like to know, are hyenas 
nocturnal. Yes, they are, Elijah. Um, uh, they're, they're most active at night, and they can cover massive distances, 20 miles in a night if they really want to. So, yes, they are nocturnal. And most of your diurnal animals will be your herbivores, the ones that eat grass, zebra, impala, wildebeest. But you do have a few nocturnal ones, like the hippopotamus. Well, Monroe Elementary, it's been spectacular. I hope you guys got some really good, big, loud lion roars away. And uh, hopefully you'll join us on another live safari soon. And I'll be able to show you some real lions and I won't have to make lots of noises like lions. Now, for everyone else, it's been always as awesome having you on the Brent and Batman show this afternoon. And we will be doing it all again uh, tomorrow morning. And uh, let's see what wonders the magical Masai Mara is going to offer. I think I might have a little dig at leopard again tomorrow morning i've got a few sne sneaky secret spots that might work out so i know how much a lot of you love leopard but from all of us here at safari live in south africa and in kenya we'll see you bright and early for the sunrise safari mm -hmm.